welcome to this special called communication for a charter review workshop. If we could all please stand and rise for a moment of silence. I thank you. If you could please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, the flag of our country. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call, please. Carlson. Here. Sierra. Maniscalco. Here. Herta. Here. Good. Here. Miranda. Here. Here. Thank you everyone for being here today. I'd like to introduce our facilitator and her assistant today, Miss Ann Schroeder and Miss Robin Odegaard. Uh, Miss Schroeder joins us from Florida Institute of Government at USF Go Bulls. For over two decades, she has worked with the city uh, and county governments, businesses, and nonprofit organizations to help chart a course for success. Anne's clients have included NASA, Ryder Systems, Coca Cola, American Lung Association, and the Salvation Army. She has a master's degree from John Hopkins University at Baltimore. In addition, Anne earned certification. Certifi excuse me, certificate degree in advanced carpentry, along with her husband, Ed, personally built their first home in Fort Myers in 1979. Also, we have Robin Oldegaard, program planner and analyst from the Florida Institute of Government, who will take notes of the proceedings that will be visible on the screen. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take public comment at this time concerning anything that we will be hearing about the city of Tampa's charter. And as always, we have three minutes for each speaker. If you would like to make any public comment concerning our charter, or any of the things that we are going to review today. Please form a line on my left, your right. First speaker. Three two one Carrington Street. It's a pleasure to see um, so many familiar faces, and when I say that, what I uh, what I am referring to is our our common service on the Charter Review Commission. Uh, as many of you know, I had the pleasure of being appointed as a commissioner and serving uh, with uh, four of the individuals uh, sitting up here on the dais today, and, and one of uh, your legal staff here today. And um, first, I wanted to say I applaud you for taking the charter very, very seriously. It's the constitution of the city of Tampa. Um, we, all as citizens, the four of you and, and um, council here who, and, and a few others who served as citizens at the time, um, as you know, took a tremendous amount of time to review uh, the, the entire charter in its entirety. Um, debated, uh, sometimes in a very heated way, uh, the provisions of the Charter, heard uh, public comment at every single meeting that we had, um, did so in the sunshine, and made a series of very detailed recommendations that were ultimately at the time approved by Council and ultimately approved by the citizens of the City of Tampa. Um, at the time, we talked and debated about the cadence of review of the um, Charter and we made a recommendation that the citizens ultimately approved um, to review it every 10 years. 
I believe that that's the proper cadence for it. I'm not suggesting that if there is an issue that needs to be addressed, an urgent issue, but I would caution the council to not do what has happened with the Florida Constitution and make it subject to things that would otherwise best be dealt with by ordinance or by other action of the city. Uh, many of the issues that are going to be talked about today are very serious issues. They do need to be addressed. I would submit to you, though, that they likely do not need to be addressed in the charter. They can be addressed by ordinance. And again, would, would caution you all um, to uh, not create a cadence here today where we're reopening our charter uh, frequently and uh, making the charter a substitute for the, the ordinance book. So I thank you very much for your time. I have the utmost trust and confidence in this group and appreciate all that you're doing for the city of Tampa. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Keela McCaskill. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this charter review. You know, earlier this year, uh, the mayor called for transparency and accountability, which, which I think is great because we need that. And I just have to believe that that was her effort to build trust, rebuild trust of the administration in this city, particularly the citizens. Because as you all know, I don't have to rehash that, but we've seen a lot. We, we've seen too much happen, and I believe it was as the result of the lack of sufficient, we don't have transparency and accountability. And so I would feel better as a citizen, and I've spoken with several citizens, and I think they will feel better um, if we were to able to have a modified charter to ensure the objectivity for all the city attorney's clients, which includes city council and the public. Because I've seen firsthand how the city, uh, city attorney chose to incorrectly interpret the charter and failed to represent, in my opinion, one of the best city council members that ever existed, and we lost that one. I'm still wounded from that loss. And then two others went under attack because, I believe, they chose to incorrectly interpret the charter. So as a result of that, we know that one way out of that is to, you know, to, to adjust the charter. I guess at one time they mentioned that it would be, you know, it would go before outside council. I don't know if we would trust that. The other option was it would go to a judge, but that's only if there's a lawsuit. So I would feel comfortable if there is an issue or if there is an issue with charter, if there is a matter that comes before council that is they don't agree with, because we still don't have trust with the city attorney, I'd like it to go, a, a, a request to go to the attorney general. That'd be the process. Go to the attorney, attorney general for legal opinion, and then it comes back. Because I believe if we have enough of those, then in fact they may need to in, in, investigate some other areas. If we continue to have issues that comes before the Attorney General. So that's my ask for that. And we the people can trust the opinion of the Attorney General. Another one is to address conflicts of interest as it relates to the mayor. Now City Council has to address that in writing. And sometimes if you don't give enough detail, they question that. I want to know how you address today and even going forward, how do we resolve the issues with the conflicts of interest for the mayor? I didn't see that in the charter when I looked it up. On, a, on um, online, and I still don't know if there is a process, but I would like for this chart, as you amend it, I want you all to make sure that the mayor is just as accountable as you are. Again, thankful for her request to have transparency and accountability, and right now I don't have that. I want to see what that process is for the mayor. And as it relates to the CRB, again, too much happened with the police chief and the mayor both of them need to be accountable, and I want to see that somewhere indicated clearly so they can't be incorrectly interpreted in the charter. We should be able to have a CRB that makes them accountable. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Connie Burton, a proud member of the NAACP. Uh, the reason I'm here this morning is to, again, echo the concerns of our community of accountability. <laughs> we believe that a charter review board should hold all persons accountable. We have seen things transpire in our communities where contracts have been given to, and then we find as you peel back the onion, uh, relationships are either contracts that started one way ended up benefiting others where the community, and especially African-American communities, don't have an opportunity to participate in bidding on the first end of it. As far as the Charter Review Board and the uh, CRB, 
I can tell you, just standing here and being a member of the NAACP, it was that organization that has a long history of standing uh, in behalf of citizens, whether it was through the lynching of black people and the NAACP raised the banner saying that another black man was lynched. As the NAAC has continued to rise to the occasion over the years to express when night Riders, the Klan, and also the police has brutalized our community. I can tell you, it is not an easy task coming here this morning because we know firsthand the history of black people when we have stood to express our issues regarding ongoing oppression, uh, police brutality, the retaliation that comes with it, even down to date. We see how people are whether it was uh, members of the NAACP having their homes exploded, whether we just see a recent case in Miami, I mean, in New York City, where men that was accused of killing Malcolm X have had to reach a $36 million settlement. We believe that if this city is to move forward, why not trust the voters? Why not trust the voters and put it on the ballot to ensure that we can be guaranteed trust and accountability? What we are asking for is that the city removes itself as being the legal arms and the eyes of the CRB, an independent council come in, and that that body has subpoena power. Why not? Everybody is being held to a level of accountability, and we are asking that you, as a Democratic Party, stand in behalf of the community that has been so oppressed. As we talk about voter suppression from Tallahassee, we, want, we are watching to see if you will have the courage as Democrats to ensure that the citizens of this community can vote their choice. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dylan Griggs. Thank you for allowing me to speak here today. Um, I'm here to make comment on the issue of adding subpoena power and independent counsel onto the ballot for the citizens of Tampa to vote on. Um, I agree that we need more accountability and oversight into the Tampa Police Department. There's been a number of cases I could reference, a number of things that have happened over the past few years that have shown time and time again that without a proper CRB that can actually do something for the citizens on behalf of the citizens and not on behalf of the city, in order to achieve that, to have a CRB that can actually provide oversight and accountability for us as citizens, I think that they do need subpoena power and independent counsel and I would like the opportunity to vote on it. I've heard a lot of things going around about um, this being like something that fringe groups are asking for or the, the kind of the legal things that are gonna come along with this um, when it comes to the types of judges and the types of courts it's going to go through. I think that that is all stuff that we can come to after we allow citizens to vote on it I don't think you should stand in the way of people being allowed to vote on this issue. All right, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Uh, hello, my name is Philip, and I would like to speak in support of giving the CRB subpoena <coughs> power and an independent counsel. And I wanted to say that the giving subpoena power to the CRB has worked in cities such as Miami and Key West. And I think it would do great here in Tampa as well to make the city a safer place for everyone living within it. And I think that giving, giving the people the power to vote on this by putting it on the ballot would help let, let the people who could not be here in city council today have their voice be heard. And that's it. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Laura Rodriguez, and I'm a member of Tampa Bay Community Action Committee. Good to see you all here. Um, and I'm here to talk about the charter uh, amendment. 
Um, and I think it's really important to allow voters to vote on this. It's not something that you guys are deciding. Um, it's something that your constituents wants and honestly allowing voters to vote on uh, methods of public oversight of a public service is democratic. And I don't think there's anything uh, faulty about that. And we all know that the CRB reviews closed cases of um, the disciplinary actions against cases of uh, police misconduct. And I think having all of the evidence uh, that can be found, whether, you know, and as time passes, more evidence can come up from the original case. So I think it, it'll just make assessing these cases and the severity of discipline applied more um, democratic and more honest. Um, and, you know, as one of these so called fringe groups, <laughs> I think it's. Uh, you're not listening to your constituents. I'm a constituent. I've lived here in Tampa for 10 years. I vote, I pay my taxes, and to uh, diminish what our group is doing um, is honestly like you guys are listening to us. Um, all, all we've ever asked is for democratic demands. We're not coming up here yelling, calling y'all names, this and the other. Um, but yeah. Um, so we think that this is just a democratic power that the people need to vote on. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name, <clears throat> excuse me. Hello, my name is Taylor Cook. I'm a member of uh, Tampa Bay Community Action Committee. I'm also here to speak in favor of letting the people vote on subpoena power. Um, cause it's kind of insane that this is such a big debate when it's really, we're just asking you to let us vote. I don't understand how we're supposed to be a progressive forward city and when we have to beg to be able to vote on an issue that people care about and that people have shown that they want. People want more transparency in Tampa. After seeing cases like Jonas Joseph and Dominique Mulkey, people, black men who were just killed for one, a bag of chips, another, I don't know what he was killed for because the case was covered up three different times. So we want, subpoena power, but we want to vote on this democratic demand. We want to be able to vote in the March ballot. We don't want to have to come here and beg to be able to vote for things that the people want and that would help the people. And because we live here and this affects us, the police affect us. I can hear their helicopters at 3 a.m. every night. Um, so we just want more transparency. We want more accountability. We don't understand why the police are so afraid of accountability. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Hi, uh, my name is David Jones. I'm a member of the Tampa Bay Community Action Committee. I'm also speaking in favor of uh, putting subpoena power, <clears throat> subpoena power on this uh, March ballot. Um, as it stands right now, we're truly not asking for a lot. We're not even asking for it to be pushed through because that's not something y'all are able to do right now. Um, you know, the actual subpoena power. We're, actually, we're asking um, that you allow the uh, citizens of Tampa to vote on it. Um, you know, uh, it, <laughs> allowing both like city council, I don't, excuse me, allowing both uh, the police department as well as like the city office to um, persuade y'all away from putting it on the ballot, putting it in the face of like the community um, is undemocratic. It's a kneecap, it's essentially kneecapping democracy, uh, something that this country and the cities were uh, built on uh, allegedly, um, allowing for the voices of the people to be uh, shut down before it's even allowed to, you know, form it um, is like amoral, it's not right. And it's something that y'all should actively fight against. Um, the issue is like right now in the city, people don't feel that the police is uh, actively working in their interest. People do not trust the police in the city. If they did, we wouldn't have to come up here. If they did, this conversation wouldn't have had to start in the first place. If they did, the CRB wouldn't have had to exist in the first place. It exists solely because the police was lacking trust. It exists solely because the people in Tampa saw that it uh, saw that they were not, um, you know, being actively represented by their police or whatever. Um, so, you know, if that issue can't fix itself on its own, then something needs to be done. Uh, measures need to be taken in order to, like, cause real change to make things better. Um, yeah, so once again, just asking that y'all put it, allow the folks to vote, allow the people to vote, because at the end of the day, who knows what we need better than us? Um, 
Yeah, and I say this as a uh, District 7 um, red resident. Um, and like, the truth of the matter is like, you know, we're prepared to uh, rally and campaign regardless. Uh, I would prefer to have a campaign around this issue, but if, it, if need be, um, we will campaign against y'all uh, because silencing the people before they're allowed to speak is um, not something that should be uh, done by city leadership. Uh, thank y'all. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Joseph Nahaba. Again, member of the uh, Tampa Bay Community Action Committee. Um, here again before you to ask uh, you all to do the right thing um, and uh, allow independent counsel and uh, subpoena power uh, to be given to you know the hands of the voters to decide. Um, and this is a very, or it should be, a very easy decision for you all because really, again, all we're asking is to just simply step aside, right, and allow the people to decide um, what they want. And clearly what they want, what they've shown, what they're coming out for and have um, spoken about, you know, publicly is for the CRB to be given these powers, <coughs> you know, but why, right? Why, why is there this distrust? Why is there this um, issue of, you know, secrecy, right, about this whole issue? Why is TPD, why is the mayor's office so afraid of accountability and transparency? I mean, as the police are so, you know, want to say, if, you know, you've got nothing to hide, then, you know, what's the problem, right? Um, well, that's what I would say to them, that if they really and truly have nothing to hide, then this should be a very easy, uh, controversy-free decision uh, for them to make. But, you know, obviously the fact of the matter is that they have a history of misconduct, right? As, as someone mentioned earlier, you know, the cases of Dominique Mulkey, Jonas Joseph, but, you know, also, um, a little more mundane things like blowing money out of, you know, strip clubs and gold teeth and this sort of thing, right? It's, it's just, it's strange, it's bizarre. And I don't know why as, you know, supposed public servants, um, police are held, you know, to this uh, amazingly uh, accountability-free standard, right? I don't think the city's, you know, sanitation workers or the district's teachers, right, are free of any kind of scrutiny. Why the police? Like, what gives them the right to be um, free of any kind of scrutiny, free of any kind of investigation? I don't understand, and I don't think a lot of the people here do either. So um, again, all we're asking for is for you all to step aside, right? Let the people decide. It's a very easy thing. We're not asking you to, to veto or, or, you know, vote up or down on this issue in particular. It's just a matter of giving it to the people. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I'm Dave Coleman, and um, I was here a couple of weeks ago. Um, transparency um, <clears throat> and accountability, those things, um, what I'm hearing so far this morning, um, would create trust. I have attended um, seven of like eight, approximately that, um, gun violence listening sessions that um, TPD has put on. Um, and um, constantly, over and over again, um, the chief asks for um, trust from the community. <clears throat> um, it's almost like a demand, um, see something, say something. It's our responsibility in the community, but I would like to think that um, here today, the, the city has an opportunity um, to advance trust in the community um, by <clears throat> and, and partnering with the police department <laughs> to create, not demand, trust. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, <clears throat> I started going um, to, to, uh, <clears throat> to those meetings and back in February I asked about the, um, so the um, social worker ride-along program. Um, it's not part of the CRB, but um, it's something that the police department was doing, and it's a really watered-down program, and I was told over and over that um, they're designing it for Tampa. They're not copying St. Pete or Eugene. Um, what's so hard to understand about a non-emergency number that a social worker shows up on a mental health issue? Why can't we advance new ideas? Um, what, what's so wrong about providing a lawyer? What's so difficult about providing a lawyer to the CRB? You have an opportunity to... Um, I'm just repeating myself again and again, but I, I had this whole speech going on, but 
you have an opportunity to create trust, <clears throat> not demand it. And, um, and a police force, what, what, what kind of word is that? A police force, you know, um, recently, and I know it had to do with the death of, 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 of an officer, but what is a giant lion head, you know, um, about to devour the, the bad guys in this city? Um, what, what kind of message do you, are you trying to send to the, to the people that are living on Main Street? <laughs> um, <clears throat> You know, I wrote all this down. Somebody brought up Dominic Mulkey, um, a, a citizen's review board that actually had some power um, and was able to relate with the community, could answer some questions. Why did the police say that that, that that incident happened blocks away from the store? It was merely down the sidewalk from where the store was. Why were there so many gun ho uh, bullet holes in the fence that I put my finger in <coughs> as we went there for the vigil? Um, <coughs> Why were, were the, houses, the houses in the background um, lit up with bullets? Um, what direction, <clears throat> they, 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 there's a, a video, a, a screenshot was released of him turning, a second screenshot where originally there was a video, and I don't know where that video is anymore, where he was walking hunched over with his arm down like this, <clears throat> away from the police while the police officer dropped a clip and added another freaking clip and fired again, but only two bullets hit this man. What, um, <clears throat> you have an opportunity to do something, to make the CRB stronger and to um, follow up with what you unanimously voted for last time I was here as far as the social worker ride along program to do nothing with it. They want a weakened nothing program that will go nowhere Thank and you, do Mr. nothing. Paul. Thank you for letting me share. Good morning, uh, James Michael Shaw, Jr. I'm a, a volunteer attorney with the ACLU of Florida. I'm taking off of work to be here today, uh, like a lot of people behind me are, but not all of them. Some of them are being paid to be here. Uh, I don't have much to say that I haven't already <laughs> said, uh, but, but I do want to address a couple of things. I understand that each of you were paid a visit recently uh, to discuss this, and, and uh, you were told that it would cost a million dollars a year to have uh, an independent attorney and subpoena authority, and the statistic that was cited was that that's what it cost Miami. I bet you weren't told this. Miami employs a director, an assistant director, a uh, senior policy analyst, three investigators, an independent attorney, and an administrative aide. Those salaries are what cost the million dollars, not enforcing subpoenas. Want to know how many subpoenas the Miami Civilian Investigatory Panel has issued since 2015? One. The one before that was in 2009. It's important to have because you can get voluntary compliance when you have subpoena power, but if you were told that those two subpoenas cost a half a million dollars each, they were not being honest with you. And it should bother you more than it bothers you when people are dishonest with you. It should really bother you when an interim police chief stood behind this podium and told you, no, we didn't chauffeur people to, to come speak in favor of the crime-free multi-housing program when they did. The reason that you need to have subpoena authority is so that the civilian investi so that the civilian uh, review board can issue subpoenas to non-party witnesses ask your legislative aides if the PBA chief made this gesture at Frank Reddick they saw it but when the professional standards bureau investigated they talked to two or three people who said I didn't see it and concluded that it never happened that's why it needs to have subpoena authority. Now I want to talk to you also about the, the idea that fringe groups are what's supporting this. I saw some of you at the NAACP Freedom Fund dinner a couple of Fridays ago and don't tell me the NAACP is a fringe group. You ate their chicken, you listened to their speakers, you applauded and then, and then two Tuesdays from now you're going to vote like they're a fringe group because somebody told you that they were? The American Civil Liberties Union of Florida is not a fringe group. The people that are in this room took the time off of work because they can. We're all here on behalf of the people who can't. The people want to vote on this. We, had a, we commissioned a third party poll. 82% of the voters want to vote on this. You were asked last by your individual visits to position yourselves in between the voters and voting on something that the voters want to vote on, to, to stop them from doing that. That's what you were asked to do. Don't do it. Think about what you, what you were thinking when you first sought office. Were you seeking office to position yourself in between the will of the voters and their right to vote on something? Or were you, were you, were you seeking office so that you can represent the people that you represent? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Yvette Lewis, president of the NAACP. Um, first of all, 
we've been around since 1909. We ain't going nowhere. So whoever said we were a fringe group, that's the lie they tell themselves when they look in the mirror. Because when I look in the mirror, I see somebody fighting for people's civil rights. But when I also come through the airport or come through um, you know, the airport the other day, it, it stated, welcome to Tampa, a diverse city. It said, welcome to Tampa, where we have a Democratic mayor and a Democratic council. It said, welcome. But yet, we don't feel welcome. Because some of our voices are being silenced in this city. Every time we come down here, and when I say we, I'm speaking as Af an African American. We come down here begging, asking, and pleading for your help, for your assistance with something. I don't quite understand why we're the only race in this city that has to beg to get the simplest things, but yet you come to our community, you sit there, zip tea, you sit there, come to us and have dinner with us, and we get nothing. But you want our vote, you want our support. I don't understand why we have to continue to go through this with y'all. Let's say it started back with our ancestors. Let's go back to the African American cemeteries that we still haven't resolved the issue on in the city of Tampa because the land was stolen. We didn't start biking while black with the police department. It started with us. They started that. We didn't start crime-free housing, renting while black. They started with us. We did not start this. We want to live in a diverse city. We want to live where we have a voice and where we can have an opportunity for our kids to go out and play. The NACP want a safe community, but we want people to be held accountable. The hardest thing and the, the, the most frightening thing is when you're riding down the street and you see them blue lights get behind you because you don't know what's going to entail. Hell, they fear their life. I fear my life. And I'm the president. All we're asking for you to do, and if you want me to say it, all we begging you to do is just vote to put it on the ballot and let, the, let it stand up or down. Give it to the people. You asked us for our vote. Hell, some of y'all members of the NACP. I saw y'all at the dinner. They call your name, you stood up and wave. I'd be damned if you call us a French group. Been in this city too long. Been fighting too long. All of y'all know that. We deserve better in the city of Champa Bay. This city has attacked this organization just because we stand up and fight for the people. The city has tried to shut us down because we stand up and fight for the people. We're going to keep fighting. Because this organization has been around since 1909. We ain't going nowhere. So whoever you send as your attack dogs, I promise you, I promise you, I got a legal department that will shut it down and embark on this city. And we will have an all-out legal war. Give the people something instead of an empty promise and a cup of tea. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Rashida Kill, Chairman of the Citizen Review Board. Uh, today, I stand as a member of the board and the statements uh, that I share today are of my own and no, represent no representation uh, to the board itself. Uh, a few things I want to bring to you all's attention uh, to take in consideration. Uh, one is through our years of serving uh, on, on the board, uh, working with various staff members of the Tampa Police Department, uh, we have made, and I say we, board members have made all types of requests. 
uh, in reference to the town police department matters. Every single request uh, requested was fulfilled. We had 100% support from the town police department in everything that we had asked for, in reference to policy, statistics, presentation, things of that nature. We have not yet seen or need subpoena power as of the, to this moment. It has not gotten in the way of us doing our responsibilities to the city. Not stating we may not need it in the future, but as of at this point, it has not created any type of hurdle in us doing our due diligence in serving this community. The other uh, statement is that we did take the consider uh, ration in discussion on our agenda. And however, we do represent the people. This is uh, a democratic system that is envious to the world. So we do have responsibility to up, up, uphold uh, such, such stage. So in saying that, we did take a vote and the members did vote unanimously uh, to allow this subject to be put on the ballot. So it was a unanimous vote uh, taken with the Citizen Review Board. So I want that to be taken into consideration as well as the support of every request fulfilled, every request asked by members of the Citizen Review Board has been fulfilled 110%. And as of this point, we, have, we had no need or have not seen any value in reference to even obtaining such power or subpoena power. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Councilman Good. Just for transparency, Mr. Shelby, uh, I did meet with the chief on Friday. I did tell her that I would be making a phone call to the CRB chairman. I did speak with him for about 20 minutes on the phone, I believe, Friday evening, I believe. Yes. And he did share his concerns with me. I won't air all of the information we talked about. What we did talk about the vote and some other issues. So I want to make that clear for transparency that he did tell me what transpired uh, during their time, his time as the chairman on the board. Thank you. Mentez not, Uhuru. Uhuru means freedom in Swahili. And we say we as African people should always be thinking about our freedom. Since 1400, we should always be thinking about our freedom. Some of our people and some people are confused about freedom. Some people are confused about freedom, but some people are indoctrinated in a certain way where they began to believe the propaganda that's fed to them. And some people believe in their own propaganda. Some people are handsome, and then they begin to believe that they look so good that they have certain rights over other people. And they think their looks would get them places. But in the real world, it don't work like that. That's not how the real world works. When people get real, then people need real results, real solutions, real suggestions. People need real representation. They need real transparency. They need real accountability. They don't need talking heads. Who would think in this city, who would think in this world, who would think in this world, in this whole world, with everything that's going on from uh, immigration, to separation, to separation from rights? Who would think in this world that an African man, blacker than me, would stand before this podium and say, we don't need accountability. We don't need subpoena power. Who would say that? Who in their right mind would say that? You couldn't get Jeff Vinnick to come down here and say that. But he probably could, but because everything's right with him. You can get the police to say that because they know everything's not right with them. They're quite familiar with the fact that everything's not right with them. They know how to abuse us inside our communities. They know how to abuse us when they get us one and one. They know how to abuse us in public. They know they are, they're supposed to uphold the Constitution. They're supposed to uphold the Bill of Rights. They're supposed to uphold the Articles of Confederation. They're supposed to uphold 1776 independence and 250 years later, and we black people down here still begging for independence. And the police still catch you on the street and ask you, 
may I search you? May I search your car? They know good and MF and well, you couldn't ask them that question. You couldn't ask them that question if they had a dead body inside their home. You couldn't ask them, they'll say, no, go and get a subpoena. Yeah, go and get a subpoena. So that's what the people need. The people need transparency. We need something. And everyone should have a voice. But what you heard before me right here, that's not a voice. That's someone that's influenced and corrupt by a corrupt system that we're trying to get straight. The people need subpoena power. The city needs it because the city needs transparency. And they need it. They should be up here asking for it. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Rocio. I'm a member of the Students for a Democratic Society, and that's exactly what we want. I believe that we should be able to vote on um, subpoena power and give the CRB the ability um, to investigate and have their own lawyers. As he said, the person before me, we know that Tampa Bay is kind of known for running like a mob. They keep uh, their crimes hidden, secret, and it only comes to light after we push and push and maybe someone has some video evidence. Um, and so if we want accountability and justice from Tampa Bay PD, we're gonna need some transparency. And so um, I hope you guys allow us to vote on um, subpoena power in CRB. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Enya. Um, me and my family have lived in Tampa for the past 15 years, and I'm here to speak um, in support of letting the people vote on giving the Civilian Review Board subpoena power and independent counsel. Um, in my time living here, I can remember countless moments where uh, the police department betrayed the public trust for, you know, in so many words, and accountability increases the public trust. Every job, um, requires accountability, and I think it's extra important when the, the decisions you make at your job are a matter of life and death. Um, I think this is a, a democratic demand. It's letting the people vote on it. I think it's very undemocratic that other forces in the city of Tampa are trying to sway your, um, you guys from taking this decision away from the people. So I hope that you will make the right decision and allow the people of Tampa um, to decide. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Simon Rowe. I've spoken here before. I'm here to speak in favor of this ballot measure. Um, but to do that, I want to clarify like some things about subpoena power based on what I've heard personally. Um, basically, we want regular people who live in Tampa to have a chance to vote on this. Like You've seen me before. You've seen a couple of people here before. We're lucky to be able to come to these, but not everyone is. And if Something that a lot of people in Tampa are able to do is access a ballot box right now, so that would be a perfect way to get their feedback. Um, so um, we are also, while we are advocating for subpoena power, we are well aware that because of the Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights, you cannot subpoena police officers directly. We are aware of that, but we still want the CRB to have subpoena power. We still think it would be important for them to have it. I've um, also heard mentioning that like subpoena, subpoena power is some outlandish, strange thing for like a public body to have when several departments of the city have it, the Civil Service Board, the Human Rights Board, the Code Enforcement Board, and I think, sorry, re referencing one article, like even the subpoena, po subpoena power is what city council has, I think, and Imagine if someone insinuated that because you all have that power, you were gonna like, violate people's rights. No, that's not what this is. It's a very common feature of our justice system. It's not a violation of rights to subpoena people, but when people don't know about it and it's hyped up as this big evil thing, it's a fairly common sense demand. That's why several other cities here in Florida have subpoena power, even with Leo Bohr. I think it's something important to have. I don't know, to speak more personally, uh, because thinking back about like the CRB members' comments about like the hurt, um, like people do get hurt by police. 
Um, in 2021, I was arrested for trespassing, and when I was arrested, um, during a pat down, the officer grabbed the <laughs> packer I had in my pants <laughs> uh, and squeezed it. Uh, it was very violating. Um, it really upset me as a trans person. It did not make me feel safe in my own body. This is not something unique to me. This is something a lot of people experience. I'm just one person. Um, and even here in Tampa, like Jenny de Leon, who was murdered, a year before her murder, was choked out and tased by a HCSO officer. And we didn't even see the body cam footage. We didn't even know what happened until someone had to get that information. Someone put in an office request and tally. Please, let our stories be heard. Let us vote. Thank you. Okay, hello. Um, <clears throat> my name is Gia Davila, and I'm here with Tampa Bay Students for a Democratic Society as well, uh, here to speak in support of putting subpoena power on the ballot, because what are we as students, as community members, supposed to do when the cops don't keep us safe, when the cops hurt us and attack us, when they don't keep our families safe? Police accountability is the only solution to this lack of justice, and what is wrong with police accountability? What is wrong with the people having a say over who polices them? Subpoena power is a very basic necessity that the people clearly support in a vast majority. Like so many people said, we're skipping school, we're skipping work. This is not like a fun day at the park for us. Um, and people clearly support this. Militar militarized police, uh, sorry, it doesn't keep us safe. Uh, it doesn't keep the people of Tampa safe but police accountability can, and this is the first step towards that. So why shouldn't the people be allowed to vote to keep themselves safe? Thank you. Good morning, Council. Kelly Benjamin, 504 Fern Street, Tampa. I uh, just wanted to echo some of the comments from our fellow members of the community and provide some historical perspective. Many of you were here several years ago uh, when this issue was first brought in front of the council seven years ago when Chairman Reddick stood, uh, sat where you are sitting today, Councilman Citro. And um, the motivation for accountability and creating a better relationship with the police department <clears throat> came out of some of the issues that were in the news at the time, obviously biking while black, but also incidences that occurred with uh, interactions with the police department uh, the horrible death of Jason Westcott and uh, a few other people that uh, have been in, in, in the news. This um, latest attempt, and, and it's, it's really unfortunate and shocking that it's been seven years that the community has been asking this board for a sense of accountability, a sense of a say in the way that communities are policed. That's all it is to create a better relationship. I know some of you up there are scholars of local history, the history of Tampa, the history of our nation. We've seen some progress, I hope, over the last 50 years during the Civil Rights Movement, during uh, what, what, ha what transpired here, uh, where, where uh, as, as uh, Councilman Vieira has uh, uh, pointed out on his crusade to create lynching memorials in the city, we know the history of this city. And we know that there is a legacy that still exists with parts of the establishment here, a legacy with segments. And I think we can do better. And this is an opportunity that all of you have as elected representatives to help create the kind of community that we want to raise our children in moving forward. Um, this is not, and it should not be seen, and it's so sad that some people see this as some big adversarial thing that's anti-law enforcement, that's somehow uh, fringe. You know, it's, it, it shows that you, you, you live in a little bit of a bubble when you say that there's fringe groups out here and try and marginalize all the people out here who have been asking for some very clear uh, uh, standards. Subpoena power, and I think there's some issues that maybe the city attorney should be uh, considering in terms of who, she, who, who this city attorney represents here. I, um, I urge this council to uh, move the city forward today with an opportunity to vote on this issue 
and, and finally get, you know, and, and I don't want to get into why, you know, that original push failed seven years ago when Buckhorn created an, an executive order and put all of his people on that council. There, so there's a reason why today maybe some of these investigations aren't happening properly on the CRB. And I think it's important to address that issue and important to address the issue that we had appointments uh, that are, you know, pushed and tugged by um, Mayor Castor to make sure that the, certain people are not allowed on that, that board. I think it's, it's unfortunate. Let's move the city forward today, have a discussion about ways that we can provide some accountability and, 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 and really think about the, the sentiments of uh, the president of the NAACP here and the ACLU who came thank here you, before Mr. you. Uh, thank you for your time. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, honorable members of council. My name is Kimberly Heinemann. I'm the chief assistant state attorney here in the state attorney's office in the 13th Circuit. Um, I'm here today to address um, the issue of subpoena power with the Citizens Review Board. Um, our office stands for the same principles as the city of transparency um, and review. However, um, today what I want to talk about, and I know Mr. Wiseman, who's our executive um, director, has talked with the council before, has talked with some of you individually before. Um, my, goal, my purpose here today is to talk about how this affects the state attorney's office and the function of the state attorney's office. Um, in addition to the issues that some of uh, the other speakers have talked about, um, where you have to navigate what subpoena power means, which is, is that transactional immunity? Is it use immunity? Um, what's the judicial oversight over that? Um, almost every one of these cases um, involves a corresponding prosecution and a civil body acting and taking uh, statements from people creates problems with our cases. That's simply the bottom line. We have had this position since we began the discussion about subpoena power, I think really in 2017. That position remains the same today. Our concerns um, correspond to our ability to prosecute offenders, bring people to justice, and do the work that the state attorney's office is required to do here in Hillsborough County. Um, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to address you this morning, um, uh, as well as thank you for the work you do for our great city. Uh, we're honored to serve with you and the members of the Tampa Police Department um, in serving the citizens of Hillsborough County. Mr. Chairman? Councilman Goose. Ma'am, are you representing the State Attorney's Office here Yes, today? sir. Yes, sir. I, I just have one question. If I can, Mr. Chairman, we have the facilitator. We are a bit off the, the roadmap that she was going to be using, but if it's the council's pleasure, it's the time we do have her here for the purpose of facilitating. Thank you, Mr. Shelby. I don't know. You have been with the state's attorney's office for how many years? Since 2005, sir. And, and that is representing the past state attorney. Our position, regardless of who the state attorney changed. is, has never Thank changed. You. Please sir. continue, Councilman Good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Shelby. Uh, my question would be today, you know, if you're saying this and you've been a state at the Hillsborough County State Attorney, what makes what you're saying different than what Dade and Brower and some of the others are doing? Uh, it seems like there's a, a conflict here if you're telling me that it will hinder versus they've been doing it. So I, I'm trying to figure out the difference here, ma'am. Um, this, this is for the public. I know. understand. And Councilman Goods, I can't speak to those other jurisdictions and what they do because I don't operate there. I can only tell you that. Um, our office has given this care for consideration and talked about how it affects our cases, and that's what we're here to do address this morning. Thank you, ma'am. Yep. Good morning. My name is E.J. Salcinas, and I have been asked to share with you some of my experiences uh, in my career in law enforcement here. I was asked earlier in the proceeding does the city council, in your opinion, have authority to create a um, subpoena power? I would think that under your home rule, your attorneys will tell you yes, it is established that you have authority to create a subpoena power. However, remember the word subpoena implies that there is some judicial authority behind the compelling authority to bring someone to testify. Therefore, 
yes, you may create a um, power to subpoena. However, remember your power extends only as far as the limits of your city. Therefore, your subpoena power is not beyond the limits of the city of Tampa. That's why, historically, for over 150 years, municipalities have depended on two major investigatory agencies in every one of our 67 counties. Number one, the resident state attorney's office has the judicial authority to issue subpoena, not just to testify, but to produce documents and records called subpoena duces tecum. The second most powerful is your county grand jury. The county grand jury exists in every one of our 67 counties. They generally are presided by the chief judge of the circuit. Therefore, at any time, that the Tampa Police Department, the Plant City Police Department, the Temple Terrace Police Department, the Sheriff's Office, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, the Florida Highway Patrol, the Florida uh, Wildlife Commission, whenever they need a subpoena power, the door in the State Attorney's Office is open and subpoenas are issued. Assume that the city creates a subpoena power for the Citizens Review Board on which I've had the privilege of serving as one of the founding members of that uh, uh, board. What if the person refuses to appear? What if the person refuses to bring forth the documents that you are subpoenaing as the Citizens Review Board. You do not have authority to conduct a contempt proceeding. That is done exclusively by an independent judicial functionary that we call a judge. Therefore, the subpoena power is based on a judicial function and not an administrative function. So sooner or later, if you created the subpoena power, your board would have to ask a judicial officer in the circuit or the county to intervene on behalf of the city of Tampa. The next thing that I want to also call your attention with is... With respect, Your Honor, with respect, I'll give you 30 seconds more. With respect, Your Honor, I'll give you 30 seconds more. Yes, sir. In closing, let me say that with the subpoena power, you cannot forget the constitutional guarantees that are guaranteed to all citizens under the Constitution of the state of Florida, as well as the Constitution of the United States, namely the Fifth Amendment. If someone refuses, you cannot compel the person. If you were in front of a judicial officer, then other issues could come up. I alert you that by giving a, a local committee a subpoena power, the other problem is the minefield that you are creating for that agency, and that is by subpoenaing someone or documents, are you creating a transactional immunity, a use immunity, limited immunity, plenary immunity? Those are issues that are very complicated, and I urge you, have your city attorney review those issues with you so that you can proceed constitutionally and in compliance with your wishes to serve the community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor.
Good morning, Council. Brandon Barclay, Vice President, Tampa PBA. I'm here today to discuss the CRB. For two years, we helped negotiate the CRB rules, and here we are yet again in void voiding that entire two-year debate. Let's cut straight to the facts. The CRB has not requested or voted on giving themselves their own power. You just heard from the chairman himself who said they don't even need it. A FOIA request, though, however, did show that Mr. Shaw of the ACLU and Mr. Valdez on the CRB have been in working extensively together to push Mr. Shaw's agenda. This is clearly laid out in their emails, which indicates that there's a telephone calls and Zoom meetings which, took, which take place regularly between the two. Mr. Shaw's claim that's for transparency, that this transparency narrative is false. This is about advancing the ACLU, its attorney, and one CRB member's opinions. And their agenda is fairness. It's fairness to everybody except for the Tampa police officer. And for that, we're going to amend our entire charter. There's six levels of review for a law enforcement officer in the state of Florida. I, know, I noticed nobody here clearly laid that out for you. Criminal Justice Training Commission, Internal Affairs, Criminal Investigations Bureau, State Attorney's Office, FDLE. All of these organizations watch over everything that's done. For them to say that there's zero accountability is laughable. Of the 47 CRB cases that have been heard, only four of those cases resulted in a different recommendation. Of the 47 cases, only four of them was there a disagreement that have currently been heard. Mr. Shaw is vehemently opposed and hostile to all law enforcement of any kind, as is evident by his recent Facebook post mocking deceased Master Patrol Officer Jesse Matson's memorial. James Shaw referenced deceased Master Police Officer Jesse Matson's memorial dedication as the following, and I quote, this is just the beginning. They're also gonna rename an elementary school after him in his honor, then they're gonna relocate a memorial sculpture to the newly renamed elementary school right in front of the door. I hope that they do the same thing for me when I die. So please remember that when you support this, you're supporting Mr. Shaw, who makes no attempt to hide his disdain for the Tampa Police Department. If this is how he speaks about officers killed in the line of duty, imagine how he's gonna treat them once you hand over the CRB to him. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like I ought to be able to respond to that, man. <laughs> please, Mr. Shaw, please be seated. Is there anyone else within chambers that wishes to speak during public comment? Good morning. Carlos Valdez. Uh, I am a member of the CRB, and I just want to share and state that my communication with Mr. Shaw was to get educated on different items and aspects as it relates to uh, the discussion, as it relates to putting the, these issues on the ballot. So we did, had just one discussion. It was not a relatively... Uh, long discussion or any type of planning. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone within chambers that would like to make public comment? Seeing none. We do have one line. Thank you. Mr. D'Angelo, are you online? Mr. D'Angelo. We will go to Ms. Pointer. Ms. Pointer, are you online? Ms. Pointer? We will go to Ms. Carol Ann Bennett. Ms. Bennett, are you online? Oh, I, I was muted. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Is this Ms. Pointer? Yes, sir. Stephanie Pointer. Um, I found it quite interesting, something that happened before this meeting that I've really never seen before. The mayor and the former mayor post posted about it on social media. Kind of shocking to me. Um, and I want to talk about something completely different than what most folks have talked about. And I, I have to say, I, I'm with those folks that being concerned about what's going on behind the scenes in our city without having any ability to uh, make that happen. Um, uh, the individuals personally offended by charter amendments might be put on the ballot. Uh, I'm sorry, as individuals personally offended. Okay, forget it. I'm sick and tired of one person denying the voters voice at the ballot. All for transportation, twice. Andrew Warren's removal, once. 
And of course, Councilman Dingfelder's forced resignation. Isn't that enough bullying for, from one person for the voters of this city, for the voters of the county? We need to get away from the thought that one person gets to dictate terms to everyone in our area. I look at the items on the agenda and the list that Mr. Shelby has submitted with full understanding behind each request. If you don't understand why someone is asking for some of these amendments, maybe it's time for you to pay more attention to what's going on in our local government. There are so many important items to be addressed today, but my passion lies with the absolute need to deal with the ethics investigations that have cost our city $325,000 over the last year or so. We have a nonpartisan ethics commission, but the investigations of both city councilman Goods and city councilman uh, Dingfelder ignored that commission. Why? That's what I want to know. I want to know who had that investigation started. How is that legal when the purse strings of this city are held by the people who are sitting on that diocese? At the comment in social media about four of you folks were on last year's charter review. I would argue that likely you guys know better than anyone because you were on the charter review why the, these amendments need to be made. The world is a different place since 2019. We've lived through a pandemic, Black Lives Matter movement, Me Too movement, housing crisis, hurricanes, Etta and Ian and more. As a teacher of history, we had the Articles of Confederation and they were crap. They were so bad that they had to be trashed and we, we had some of the best thinkers in the history of our, our country rewrote a new document called the Constitution and it still has amendments. So why the pushback on amending something that's not currently working? I just don't understand it. I'd also like to note um, if the NAACP, didn't, didn't somebody give them $100,000 out of the budget? So if they're a fringe organization, maybe somebody should look into that further, but I'm kind of thinking that legitimizing the NAACP by giving them $100,000 of our tax money kind of makes the statement that they are fringe a real issue for me. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bennett, are you online? Hi, my name is Carol Ann Bennett. Um, I don't know what the solution is to all the problems, but I can tell you what the problems are and how concerned I am about them and how I believe something needs to be done, done about it. I'm very concerned that three council members um, were attacked and that coincidentally the three council members had a similar voting pattern. I'm concerned that slap lawsuits will be used to remove council members who are only doing their jobs and listening to the citizens. I'm concerned that lawsuits are being weaponized to put fear in elected officials. I'm afraid that the weapon of crushing legal fees will be used to control our elected officials. We must do something to protect the independence of our elected officials so they can do their job. We must take action to defend them so that they are not afraid to vote the way that they think is the right way to vote. I'm concerned that $300,000, which by the way is half the city's annual sidewalk fund, mm. was spent on one complaint by one person that had not filed a lawsuit. There was no sworn testimony. There was no cross-examination. There was a written request from the employee begging the city to stop the investigation. If a corporation settled a complaint like that with no lawsuit, no sworn testimony, no cross-examination, and a written request to stop, the, state, the stockholders would sue. Tax money was spent on $100,000 in legal fees. We have an ethics commission. Why wasn't this sent to them? I'd like to know how many other complaints against the city have been settled this way. And this is not a rhetorical question. I really want to know how many other complaints against the city have been settled this way. 
Thank you. Thank you. Is Ms. De Mr. D'Angelo on the line? Chair, Mr. D'Angelo did not sign on this morning, so that will conclude public comments. Thank you very much. I also have Ms. McCaskill on, on our list, but I believe she appeared earlier and spoke in council chambers. Council McCarlson. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I I'm sorry. Can I just speak first? Um, just in response to some of this, um, and also the tweets last night. Um, you know, unfortunately for the mayor and her predecessor, this is the United States, and we have a separation of power in the United States. We believe in democracy in the United States. Uh, we believe in a balance of power in the United States. Uh, the people who formed our government and also formed the city and the state formed it in a way that there's a balance so that one person couldn't control everything and so that the public would have adequate representation. That representation has not been able to be shown because of a lot of things that have happened inside the city. Um, so people come and talk about um, modifying the, the charter. It's always been the charter that the city council could modify it. When we were on the Charter Review Commission, we added the Charter Review Commission coming back every 10 years. Um, so it's not breaking the rules by doing that. That's one of the ways. But the reason why I'm here and, the re and my concern today is there's a third way of editing the charter, and that's by prior opinions of prior city attorneys. They have made opinions that have, in effect, changed the charter. Uh, for example, the, the claim that city council can't delegate subpoena power because we don't have it. It's in section 2.14. Mm. I can read it if you all want. We have it. And so why would, a, why would a city attorney give a false opinion like that? They said that only the mayor can name buildings. That's not in the charter either. There are many, many claims that the city attorney, former city attorneys have made with two paragraphs effectively changing the charter. This is not democratic. Even if we vote on something today, it has to go before voters. The voters will decide this. So why not let voters have a decision? It's, it's, a, it's about much more than the CRB here today. It's about the balance of powers and making sure that we have adequate legal representation for the voters be, that we represent. Um, and we have to undo these other things. There's been a discussion about charter versus ordinance, and I would, if the legal department is now going to make that claim today, I would say, since we've been discussing this for more than a year, why haven't they come forward before now and said, why don't you put these things in ordinances? They have not. Um, we need to provide oversight. Unfortunately for the administration, the city council is, is tasked and voted to provide oversight. You know, why is it that it took six months for us to find out who made the decision to not put Hannah Avenue out for vote? Why is it that it took us almost six months to find out that the, that the city of Tampa is under United States Justice Department civil rights investigation? For the second time in seven years, it's the biggest thing happening in the city and it took us months to find out. Why is it that last week, I asked questions about the incinerator plant and the staff would not tell me the answers. They wouldn't tell me what the 10-year costs were. They wouldn't tell me what the 30-year costs were. Why is it that we asked questions about the Rome Yard contract, we couldn't get answers to it? Why is it that when we ask questions about toilet tap, they give us different answers and they try to hide answers? The, the, the public wants us to provide oversight and to provide that oversight, we need proper legal counsel. Why is it that there's lobbying? Why is it that yesterday, uh, my aide was, had a city attorney represented uh, TPD and not a city attorney representing city council. City, city attorney also represents city council. The city attorney is supposed to be objective in, in representing its clients or it's supposed to make clear who, which client it's representing. And that didn't happen in my briefing. I don't know about the rest of them. Most importantly, why is the administration, former administration, afraid? What are they afraid of? The tweets last night re represent fear. What are they afraid of? Are they afraid that we're going to provide more, more oversight? Are they afraid that we're going to get proper legal counsel? Are they afraid that, that the legal department is going to be objective and not skewed to what they want? Are they afraid that we're going to call them out on being lobbyists? We have four members of the Charter Review Commission here and two on legal staff. They can pro we have unique experience to be able to bring to the table today to edit some of these things, to fix the problem so that the public has proper representation. This is about the public, not us. And ultimately, the public's going to decide. Why shouldn't the public decide these things? Ultimately, we're all, I think, going up for election in March and then maybe again in May. The voters are going to decide whether they agree with us today. They're going to decide about the decisions we're going to make. They're going to decide about whether we should have allowed lobbying within the city. They're going to ask us if we provide uh, oversight. The mayor is not going to decide whether our, we get reelected. In fact, the mayor is probably below 50 percent in prop popularity right now. That's why there's movement for millions of dollars to try to find somebody to run against her. They, it's time for us to, 
to, to represent this city and provide proper oversight and get legal counsel that represents us. Somebody mentioned a corporation. If there was a corporation and I found it that my law firm was representing my opposition and, and, and working against me, I would fire them and sue them. I would make sure they get disbarred. And if we don't, if we don't amend this charter, we're going down a path where we're gonna have big problems in this city because we cannot go on with, with uh, bias counts and bias coverage. We need to properly represent this city and the voters of this city, and we need proper legal counsel. Thank you. Mr. Shelby, please. Uh, Chief Bennett, there were some serious questions asked. Would you like to answer any of those questions? Good morning, Council. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, public. John Bennett, Chief of Staff. Um, we are here for the public today, and, and I think over the last three years of this administration, we've demonstrated that as an administration. I don't get into politics. I don't do tweets. I don't do social media. I just come in and work 15 hours a day along with a lot of my colleagues to try and get the city to move forward. I'm going to take literally three seconds and show something that I think is a picture of a thousand words. I asked for this picture, and nobody else did. The reason I asked for it is because I went through the CRB process with you, with the police department, with the public over an extended period of time. This was the signing ceremony where the mayor, the mayor stood down the process and moved together to bring an ordinance and an executive order and united. This is progress. We've been showing progress. I'm asking what is the gap that we haven't closed. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Shelby. Council had directed me to hire a facilitator to facilitate the process. And the process was set forth by the facilitator and it was done for a specific purpose and frankly, Council has invested in having the facilitator to control the process and to be able to uh, achieve the outcomes which haven't quite frankly, uh, and the overview of the process hasn't even been discussed yet. So that being said, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, respectfully to you and to the rest of council, um, the purpose of having a facilitator is to be able to have the facilitator control the process with council's <laughs> assent. And up until this point, I don't believe she has even stepped to the podium and we've already had public comment and we've had comments of city council and staff. So it's council's pleasure how they want to conduct this meeting, but it took some time to. Mr. Shelby, and therein lies the question that I am going to ask our facilitator. Yes. Thank you. Ms. Schroeder. Good morning. Good morning. Come on up to the podium, please. I have two sets of directions, <coughs> and I'm wondering which one you would prefer. We have, from Mr. Shelby, a list of 21 items that were emailed to us to be discussed. We also have the purpose and the proposed process of the charter discussion. And the number one thing up there says, each city council member will review one by one their list of suggested charter amendments. How would you like to proceed as a faci facilitator that is being paid with tax dollars? Good morning. Before I address that, if I may, let yes, me just explain my role. And certainly good morning to the commissioner's chair and to council attorney Shelby and members of the administration. Uh, my role as a facilitator is neutral. I am neutral to, con to content. I did help in design the process and may make procedural suggestions. The content comes from you and of course from the, the public. If we could just for a moment, we've got a slide, there are simply two outcomes for today. And as you can see that it's to explore, discuss and develop charter topics and then determine next steps. Along with those next steps, of course, will be a timeline. And we do have a memo that mentions the timeline to get it on the ballot. As Chairman Citro mentioned, we've got two ways to proceed, either the order as they are in the charter sections or those commissioners 
who wish in turn to make uh, suggestions. My understanding also is that instead of a supermajority, that we have a vote of four in order to indicate that that particular okay. issue will go forward. Am I correct? I see heads nodding. Thank you. For the purposes of keeping this very visual, we have a real-time note taker that will be putting information up on the screen. That will be wordsmithed later, because you know wordsmithing can be a very delicate process. And wordsmithing will come out of, of uh, Mr. Shelby's office and will fit the timetable that has been laid out. So back to your original question. Let me put it to the group how you would like to proceed. How many of you, by show of a vote, would like to go in order as it is laid out in the charter? And I know most of us have a print copy. Am I correct? Mine happens to be Supplement 135. You may have Supplement 120. Nevertheless, we can go by sections. How many of you would would prefer to go in that manner simply in order, and then whoever has that issue would simply raise his or her hand. Could you show it? Or, or leak fashion, yes ma'am. Let me see a show of hands, because I, I, I can't tell what's in your head. May, may I ask one question? Sure, yes, well, Mr. Vieira. Yes ma'am, thank you. Uh, can you list the second option just so that we're all, uh, could you restate the, the two options just so? Person, yes, person. the two okay, options. Person, person. One option is that whomever wishes to speak raises his or her hand and said, here's my issue. Mm -hmm. And we proceed in that fashion. The second, and perhaps I have said these in, in the opposite manner, but nevertheless, the second one is simply to go in order of how the charter is laid out. And if that's your issue, that's when you would speak. Either way, you'll get a chance to speak. Don't they both, set, don't they both satisfy the ends? Yeah. They, they do, in, in, in my opinion, if we go by the list we have here, we won't be going around Robin. We will talk about each discussion in an orderly fashion. However, it is the pleasure of council. So may I see the, the show of hands? How many wish to go in the order as it's laid out? All right, we have enough votes for that. Due to the time, it's 1030. I'm going to call for a stretch break. We'll come back in 10 minutes and we'll proceed. I, yes, Mr. Shelby. I'm just, I just want to be clear. When you say the list, what list are you referring to in the, the charter? You had no, the charter? The charter. The charter. No, wait, so no, you're holding up two different documents. That's why I want to be clear on it. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, may, 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 I just address, may I just address just very briefly that the 21 items? The 21 items, that's what I was referring right. to. Well, that the is not. The 21 items that you had sent to us. That is not an exhaustive list, as a matter of fact. That, uh, that list, as a matter of fact, I, don't, I hadn't even intended to speak to it unless it was an interest of counsel. Because quite frankly, this was a list compiled from discussions of charter-related issues over the course of the term of this council. And my basis was, at the direction of the chair at the time, whereas concerns were raised with the language of the charter or issue taken with interpretations of the language within the charter. Now, council, I, I do not uh, intend to advocate for any of these. They are not mine. They were raised by uh, council over time. Um, on a basis of certain issues that are overarching, one of them being primarily the separation of powers. So it's not my intention to advocate for this, this list, and I will assure you that this list is not necessarily reflective of what this particular council wants to discuss. Mr. Chairman. Wow. Mr. Chairman. I, I, please, <laughs> one, one, one second. Please. Is she leading or is chair leading? <laughs> Actually, the facilitator is, is so the the, Councilman Carlson, give me one second, please, and thank you. It took the Charter Review Commission 13 months to go through the charter. I do not believe we can accomplish that in one day here. That is why when Mr. Shelby sent me this list, 
of discussions that were going on during the course, that's what I thought the direction we were going to be going. However, since I have some council members that are shaking their heads, let's try and accomplish getting 13 months worth of work into one day. Councilman Carlson. May I clarify my comments? When yes. I said go through the charter simply meant going in order without going through each section. So for example, we would start with Article 1, Section 101, 102, 103, 104. Which of those would someone like to speak on? That's what I meant. Councilman Carlson. Not each one. Councilman Carlson. The, um, one of the tweets the mayor sent last night was um, complaining that, that Mr. Shelby's memo went out at 1 a.m. yesterday. Our rules that we agreed to a couple months ago always said that each city council member would present their own. We don't have an obligation to let the mayor know in advance what we're going to present because that's the process we agreed to. However, I want to let the public know, and just for disclosure to everybody, even if we approve something today, uh, the mayor still can veto it. If the mayor vetoes it, then it comes back to us, and we have to get five votes to still move it forward. Um, uh, if we have, we originally had said, I had suggested that we have five votes for something or we don't push it forward, but we said four today. So if something gets four votes and it goes to the mayor, she vetoes it, and then it'll come back to us. Um, then even if we approve it um, and the mayor doesn't object, then it has to go for two readings, uh, public readings before. So it, for anybody who thinks we're going to put something on the ballot today, we cannot. Uh, for anybody who's concerned that something is going to be squeezed through without public oversight, we've we've got at least three points of public oversight beyond this today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you are asking for a ten minute recess. Yes, sir. Thank you. Let's take a ten Let's minute do recess. So. Be back here in ten minutes. <laughs>
Council's back in session. Roll call, please. Nana Scalco? Here. Miranda? Here. Hertak? Here. Carlson? Here. Booth? Here. Vieira? Here. Citro? Here. Uh, council members, without objection, we will break for lunch at 12 or as close to there after. Sorry. Okay. Thank you very much. Ms. Schroeder? Welcome back. Just to reiterate then with our process, what we have found is it tends to help if we have a few protocols that we can work with. And we have those up on the screen as well as over here on a chart and I will just go through those very, very quickly. Obviously we're good at sharing the floor. Allow each person to finish comments so that we're not talking over one another. Strive toward economy of words. If at all possible, be succinct. I will ask you when it's time for you to make your comments to give something in the form of a headline to basically say, here's my topic and then fill in and here's my rationale for why I would like that change. And then we will have a discussion. We'll ask that you just speak from your own knowledge, your own information. In other words, withhold personalizing comments that from your experience, this is how you would like to present your information. And of course, working toward desired outcomes, which is to get through as much as we possibly can. As Chairman Citro said, uh, rather than 13, we're going to do this in a few, a few hours. Breaking at lunch at noon is what we're working toward. And just a reminder also on the timeline, there is a memo that states the first reading is December 1, possibly the second reading December 15th or January 5th. It goes to the printer January the 20th to be on the ballot March the 7th. And wordsmithing will take place through Mr. Shelby's office. We have real-time note-taking and she will change that as needed as we go through it. So it'll appear and then you will see changes based on other kinds of, of comments. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Schroeder. Did you say what you said wordsmithing would come through my office? Are you saying that the ballot language would be prepared? Through that wordsmithing before you bring it back to the first reading, there has to be possibly wordsmithing. We're not assuming that we'll get the final language today. We will get oh, as close okay. as we can. You and I had not discussed that I in terms of that, but if I can. There will be wordsmithing, let's put it that way. There has to be wordsmithing, yes. but I had assumed, at least speaking with Ms. Zellman, that that would be through the staff of the legal department. I think, in I, a, I'm sorry. Councilman Carlson, you are recognized. In, in a prior, in, the, in some of the original motions we made to this, we said that we would like the uh, city attorney to hire outside counsel because the city attorney is backed up. There's no way we'll hit the deadline if they do it themselves. So um, ultimately, they have to review it, but we would, they would have to hire outside counsel with input from our attorney. That sounds fine. As long as we recognize that the wordsmithing will, will be done and that we're not going to spend the time to necessarily look at every grammatical issue, every comma, but to get the main essence of what you're attempting to put across. And, and I, th I think the city attorney offered us to pick the attorney we want from the list of pre-approved attorneys. So if we're not prepared to do that today, maybe we could do that on Thursday, thank you. Thank you, understandable. So if we could, as we mentioned, go in order simply as the charter is laid out and whoever wishes to speak on anything from Article One, incorporation and form of government. We have four sections. Who would like to speak to one of those? Raise your hand and let us know what your topic is and we will proceed. We have purpose. I'm looking at, at supplement number 135. I think you may have supplement sections. 120. There, if you can go by sections, that would make it clear. Section one is purpose, 
Two is body corporate. Three is powers. Uh, four is separation of powers. So it's, if I may ask, Mr. Chairman, just so that I'm clear, it's Council's desire to review the entire mm -hmm. charter during this workshop? No. Uh, no. We, we've already going, talked about this. Yes, I know. So is this going to be, but, yeah, but is it going to be? You're no, she's, isn't she leading this meeting? It's, no. I'm confused. Who's allowing me to talk here? That's the question. I thought who, who, she was taking over. Are you taking over? Yes, she is. Thank okay, you. well then she can recognize me, no offense. But this is, I'm, I'm frustrated because we already talked about this. We're just going down the line. Section one, anybody have something on one, two, three, or four? No, okay, let's move on. Sorry, I don't mean to be snippy, but we have a lot to cover, and we already discussed this just before we went to break. Thank you. So nothing in section one. Yes, let's one, proceed. 1.04. Am I recognized, ma'am? Yes. In section 104, you talk about separation of powers. Mr. Shelby has laid out the question and the example. The question so the public can know the question of how to resolve a dispute between the mayor and the city council disputed interpretation of languages in section 501, 5.01a, the city attorney shall be the final legal representat representative for the city. The example of a curative language, in the event of a dispute between the mayor and city council, which cannot be reconciled, the city shall utilize independent counsel in a court of, of competent jurisdiction. Uh, I think that's, we've seen that happen several times, and I think when there is a conflict, uh, sometimes, I don't want to say that all the information has been, that, been given to, the, uh, to this council, but at times we have to fish ourselves, and I just think that the, the battle sometimes of finding what fact versus fiction doesn't happen all the time, and so I, I would suggest that we look at <coughs> making sure that we have that. So you have the city attorney's office, but if there's a conflict with the interpretation of the legal department with city council and the mayor's office, I believe that uh, another jurisdiction should look at that to give us a competent uh, decision on what the interpretation should be. Thank you, Mr. Good. So in referring to the document that Mr. Shelby had put together, you were reading the curative language. Yes, ma'am. That you're saying that's your rationale. Yes, ma'am. Other discussion? Ms. Hertag. Um, I agree. Uh, I think that makes perfect sense. My only disagreement is I do not, um, I believe council member, uh, I, I don't remember who spoke about it this morning about sending it to the AG and I disagree. I think it should be an outside independent council um, that would arbitrate uh, a dispute between the mayor and council. So that's what I would like to see, which I, I believe um, is this language, but I just wanted to reiterate that I would prefer that and not um, the AG's office. Can I, Mr. Carlson. How do we get called on? Should we raise our hand and you'll call on us? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I have something that I would like to propose for section um, six as a, as a new section point 6.09, but it's, it's relevant or an alternative to what uh, Mr. Shelby put down. Should I, should, should I read this one now or should, should we hold uh, the, the one that was just proposed and discuss them both under six? I'll just read mine. Um, it, what I would suggest is a new section 6.0. The, the, the issue here is that <clears throat> when the, the, the city attorney gives an edict, um, which sounds like a Supreme Court ruling, it sounds like it, they are the judicial branch of the city, which they are not. And if we disagree with it, for example, only the mayor has the right to name buildings. It's ridiculous. It do, it's not in any way described in the charter. So how do we resolve that? The only way we can resolve it is, is if we collectively file a lawsuit or we individually file a lawsuit. And I want to avoid lawsuits. And the way I do it in the private sector is by setting up an arbitration panel. The, the two, if we go before a judge, um, I presume, unless legal has a different opinion, we have to file a lawsuit to go before a judge. Here's what I would recommend. We obviously need a conflict resolution. So everybody who was complaining about what we're going to do with the charter, number one, we need a conflict resolution process because otherwise we're going to have lawsuits. We've got city council members who have been attacked and not protected by city, the, the city attorney, which they should have been by charter. The charter clearly says in uh, section A under, two, under section two, defend the rights and interests of the city or any officer of the city in any suit or prosecution for any act in the discharge of official duties. And the city attorney has not done that. And so what is, what is our option? Individually we can sue, as a collective body we can sue. 
what I suggest so that we don't allow the city attorney to become the judicial branch and, and change the charter without a vote of the public, we should have uh, a conflict resolution clause. I'm suggesting 6.09. Here's the language I, I oh, sorry. Here's the language I propose. Um, should a conflict arise between city council and the mayor or between either party and the city attorney, such conflict should be resolved in a quick, objective, and collegial manner so as to best represent the interests of the city of the residents of Tampa. In the event of a conflict, the two parties, under coordination by the city attorney, will appoint an arbitration panel consisting of three arbitrators who will be jointly selected by the two parties, either through their attorneys or outside counsel appointed by the city attorney. The two parties will represent their case to the arbitration panel. The arbitration panel will give their judgment on the matter and both parties will be bound by their ruling. The, the, I think the choice is we go before a judge or we go before the arbitration panel or we can call the attorney general. But all of those, uh, the, the, the judge and the attorney general escalate some things the, the decision about who can name buildings, it's ridiculous that a former city attorney made that an edict. And, and we, have to, uh, we have to figure out how we, how we can navigate this. It's easier in the private sector, both sides pick three arbitrators. That way it's, it's, it's clear that they're objective. What's happened in the past is the city attorney will pick an outside attorney, but that attorney reports to the city attorney, the city attorney reports to the mayor, and there's bias in that process. The public wants it to be objective. So we either need a process to go before a judge or we need a process to go before an arbitration panel. Thank you. So in following up with Mr. Good's comments, you would like to add a piece to that curative language? What I'm saying is there, whether it's in section one or section six, we need to choose one or the other. It's not, we cannot, if we do anything today, we need an, a, a conflict resolution policy because we're headed to multiple lawsuits right now. The only way to protect the public, when the city staff last week would not give us the information we asked about the incinerator plant, they won't give us accurate information about the Pure Project, Toilet Tap. They won't give us the information we need. The only, op the only option we have, and then when the city attorney is defending them and not defending city council, the only choice we have is to sue. That's not good for the taxpayers. We shouldn't have to sue to get transparency and accountability. So the choice is we either go to a judge or we go to arbitration panel. I don't know of another choice, but those are the two things that I would like to put on the table as options. Other discussion, Mr. Vieira. Thank you, ma'am. Um, just, I, I guess my, my thoughts on a lot of issues that we're discussing today, I guess on procedure, not necessarily on substance, um, is that we're dealing with hefty issues changing the city <laughs> charter. Again, I'm not opposed to changing the city's charter, like I've said, on, on, on issues with, due, with uh, uh, due consideration, et cetera, et cetera. We had a meeting about a month ago that we canceled at 11 o'clock, saying we didn't have enough time, moved it to today. Now we're dealing with a lot of issues upon first formal impression, right? Um, that may be right, may be wrong, may be misguided, may be correct, may be reactive, may not be, but just the, the consideration procedurally that they're getting just bothers me. This does not include the CRB changes, by the way, um, which have been around for years. People are familiar with this issue. We can deal with those issues today and, and give our thoughts, et cetera, et cetera. But on some of these larger procedural issues going, well, I think this, I think that, we're you know trying to cram potentially a uh, size 46 waist into size 32 pants right now with these issues. And that's what bothers me um, is, a, is a procedural issue is the the time given that should be more thoughtful and, and, and more hefty uh, to such issues. Again, that does not include the CRB. That should be taken care of today. There's people here for that, et cetera. Just um, a concern that I have, not saying I'll vote no based upon that, but just something that weighs upon me and I think should weigh upon reasonable folks, my opinion. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, understandable that when there's a time constraint, meaning we have a day, we have supposedly till this afternoon, and we would like to accomplish, you would like to accomplish as much as possible. It's not the final language as we have mentioned earlier. So if you were to add anything to the curative language that's been suggested by Mr. Goods for this, what would you, what would you add? Would you add something to that? I mean, I, I, I'm looking at this, et cetera. I'm not ready for a public comment on it yet on this particular proposal. That's, that's the whole issue is it's, a, it's first impression. You got to think about it, et cetera. Talk to people who are professionals in the area, et cetera. I mean, that's, that's my whole objection. It's not anything dealing with you. Again, 
we had this issue scheduled a month ago and we left at 11 o'clock. We could have used that time to deal with these issues, right? And now we're having many of them upon first impression, just something that bothers me. Again, it's, it's procedure, not substance, uh, in my opinion, excluding the CRB issues. Thank you. Yes, and as your neutral facilitator, as I said, my comment is not on, on the content, but on your process. So from what I'm picking up, this is certainly a large issue. So, Mr. Goods, would you like to add anything to that? No, I don't think it's a lot. It's just pretty simple. I mean, you know, I mean, we've been here for almost four years. I mean, we've seen what happened. So I don't see the, the big argument or have to have outside people to look at this and that. I mean, I think the suggestion that Mr. Carlson just made, I mean, you know, could probably go along with that, I mean, you know, to, to, to counter that. Uh, I, I don't see that as a big issue to, to, to move something forward. Some of these things here that's on our list here are very small and can be dealt with today and be done with, and the voters can look at it, have come back for our first second reading, but some of these things are very simple that can be tweaked and, and they need to be tweaked. Do I understand you to say, in, in agreeing with Mr. Carlson, the issue about the judge or the arbitration panel? Yeah, I, I, think, that's, I think that would be fair because you, you, you could come in some suits, but I, I think that could be fair. Uh, but I think that's needed to have some kind of resolve on some of our issues, though, because there are times there are conflicts. Yes. Uh, Mr. Miranda. Thank you very much, Ms. Schroeder. I, uh, I've been listening and not saying much. And, you know, I've worked, had the opportunity to work with Mayor Pohl, Mayor Greco, Mayor Aorio, Mayor Buckhorn, and now Mayor Castor. They're all different. They all had a different attitude. They all have a different personality. Each one of them were different but they all had one thing in gold. They wanted to make the city better than how they found it. So they proposed and they ran on that platform. And you know what? That intuition of making it better is what got us where we're at today. I don't see it as most of city council, other members see it. If I got to tell somebody to go H-E double hockey sticks, I go tell them right to their face. I don't need an arbitration. I don't need a person to try to smooth things over because I handle it one on one, not in front of the media, not in front of the city council to bring my city down. If I have a difference of opinion, and that's just my opinion, and I'm not saying my opinion is correct, I take it right to, the, right to where it's gotta go. So what, what I see coming here from the limited conversation we've had we're going to create a slower process to get even longer. Because now you're going to interject another layer of an arbitrator or lawsuits. I haven't heard of a lawsuit coming, but maybe some have. I don't Twitter. I don't go on the Internet. I don't do none of those things. I don't even watch national news. So the opinion you get, whether you like it or not, is somebody who hasn't been fo force-fed to do it one way or the other. If there's lawsuits coming, let them come. That's what the courts are for. But I'm not going to start setting bodies everywhere for everything we do to say we can't do this and can't do that, and this is wrong, and this is not quite like I want it. We have a problem, in my mind. The problem is that we have eight elected officials, and we work under the strong mayor form of government. That doesn't mean that you can't change something if you have five votes. Anything the mayor does, With five votes, you can overrule the mayor. Anything the council does, that whoever the mayor is of the five, and it did happen once with Pope. It happened in 1974 on a vote with a union wearing firefighters' pay. We agreed to a, to a salary, and the mayor rejected it. He had the right to do that. And on a five to two vote, he was overturned. So it does happen. All you need is five votes of the elected officials to say yay or nay, no matter who the mayor is. So these things that we're going through now, and you're going to listen to a lot more, by the time we finish with all this, <laughs> you'll be climbing a long ladder to hell because you ain't going nowhere. You got to understand that the system is, this is a strong mayor form of government. That doesn't mean that that person of the five that I've had the pleasure of working with can ramrod everything they want over you. That means that you have the right to negotiate with five votes. And that's your safety valve right there. So 
So we're, we're going to do a lot of talking today, and fine is fine with me. But I also have today an appointment at 3.15 that I have got to keep. And I've got to be there by 3 o'clock. Thank That's you. All. Thank you very much, Ms. Short. Thank you. So may, may we understand then that you do not support the curative language that the city shall utilize independent counsel in the court of competent jurisdiction? No, ma'am, I do not. You already have, under the, the charter we have, here's where the problem is. One person, he or she, is a state attorney. He or she handles both sides. And there's what another conflict is. Thank you. Mr. Carlson, and then. Yeah, the problem in, in this case is not necessarily between the city council and the mayor's office, although part of it is because the city attorney uh, reports to the mayor. But we have opinions of the city attorney, which in effect changed the charter. And what we need is a, is a dispute resolution process to figure that out. Because if the, when the city attorney makes an opinion, um, if, uh, it, it's hard for city council to overrule that. An example, we had a case recently where we found out that the administration had not put a very expensive project up for bid. And, uh, and then we asked to review it and asked to discuss it and then asked to potentially uh, cancel the contract. The city attorney uh, informed us that we couldn't even discuss that in this chamber. There was no way that we could cure this uh, without going to some other kind of legal counsel. The private legal counsel I got said that not only was the city attorney's review of the, uh, what's called the CCNA process incorrect, but that the, the city attorney's attempt to stifle us was incorrect as well. And so we should have been able to talk about it, but, that, but the, what the city attorney said is that we each would get individually sued and the city attorney would not protect us if we even discussed it publicly. And so there's got to be a way to resolve that. We can't, we can't allow our own attorney, imagine if you hire a private attorney for your company or your individual and your own attorney is working against you and threatening you like that. They can give you their opinion, but the attorney is not the judge and jury. I, so I, would, I don't know what your process is, but I would make a motion. I think we should just vote these up and down. We don't need a long discussion. And so I would just, I would just recommend um, unless, unless Councilmember Goods wants to recommend something else, I would recommend that for conflict resolution, I would recommend the paragraph I have here, six point, a new 6.09. By the way, what this, if we say yes, what this means is the city attorney is going to look at it. We can have a uh, one-on-one -on -one conversation with the city attorney, and then it will be presented back for first reading. The public and city council will have plenty of opportunities to discuss it. But I would, I would make a motion that we move this forward for the city council to, for the city attorney office to, uh, to edit. Mr. Carlson has made a motion. May I ask, though, the 609 on my supplement 135, I don't see that. Can you hand that to her? That's my, I'll just give you my copy. Is that something that can be put? It would be adding yes. a section. Yes. I don't know how to go. I don't know how to go. Can we see if we, if we don't have yes. a second, then it's dead. So we can move on to the next one. From what I'm being told from the, the side is that the city attorney wishes to make a comment. May I do so? Yes. May we be brief? Yes. Thank you. And then we will re-entertain re the motion. Andrea Zellman, city attorney. I'll be very brief and just focus on this issue. The city cannot sue itself. The city cannot bring a dispute to a court of competence jurisdiction if it's between two parts of the city. We can ask an independent counsel to provide an advisory opinion, which has been done in the past when the city council and the city didn't agree on something, or and the city attorney, I believe. But the city cannot sue itself, so it's a waste of time to add language talking about bringing a disagreement between city council and the city attorney's office or city council and the mayor to a court of competent jurisdiction or an arbitration panel because it cannot be done. An arbitration panel would be in place of the city attorney hiring an outside attorney because we know that hiring an outside attorney ends up uh, potentially having bias connected to it and we've seen how investigations have gone and others which have been directed by the administration through the city attorney and what we need to do is make sure that we have uh, competent, um, objective legal advice for, for the city council. I don't see how an arbitration panel is not, is not a lawsuit. I, it, what they I would they resolve civil disputes. 
and you cannot have a civil dispute between the, two the point is what is the process by which city council can get fair a fair hearing if if city attorney who reports to the mayor um, hires an outside attorney we know what the outcome of that's going to be so I wanted to be brief but but let me be clear I represent the city of Tampa what I hear coming you also from you mr. Carlson is differences of opinion that you've had with past city attorneys with past mayors with others what I would suggest is that a charter amendment is not necessary to resolve differences of opinion okay well, we're gonna the find out in a second I would whether we have four is that you talk to, to talk to my office talk to the administration let us set up meetings we can resolve these issues. You and I had a discussion about the settlement process. I propose solutions in a memorandum to you. Um, you. You all approved a process regarding naming. If you don't like it now, we can readdress that. We don't have to amend the charter to resolve differences of opinion. But I just, again, I, I wanted to just stick to the very issue that was in front of us we cannot take disagreements between branches of government to a dispute resolution process that's provided for civil litigation because the city can't sue itself. Thank you, Ms. Elman. And if I can, make, if I can be recognized, please. Martin Shelby. Uh, before that, I did see another hand. Yes, uh, Mr. Maniscalco. Thank you very much, and I appreciate everybody's comments. However. I feel like we've been at war with each other for about three and a half, almost four years. Uh, and it's very unfortunate because all eight elected officials are good people. I know them all. I work with them. I spend a lot of time with them. However, uh, in discussing this issue, I know that Mr. Shelby, one of the hardest working individuals I know, uh, is the first city and first and only city council attorney. We didn't have that position until 2004. Before that, we just had a city attorney. We had the opinion of that individual and their office, and the position was created for city council to have their own uh, separate independent attorney that is hired and fired by this body. The mayor has no say. Having said that, there is a separation. There is the balance, in my opinion, because we now have two opinions. Um, unfortunately, uh, in the last year, um, other things have happened with other council members that uh, we, we may not agree with. And uh, the charter is very clear in what it says uh, in regards to um, the city defending council members and whatnot. I don't think that needs to be changed or updated. We just need to follow what is existing in the charter. Um, having this arbitrator, this, this third party panel to settle disagreements, I thought that was settled when we hired our city council attorney. We have, a different, we have a different opinion here that's an independent individual from the mayor's office, so why is it that we have to have this mediator essentially to uh, settle conflict? Uh, I just, I understand it, but at the same time, I don't know if, 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 if it's necessary, so thank you. Thank you. Mr. Shelby, and then we'll go back to a motion. The, the memo that I sent out seems to be changing the process, and that is an unfortunate, unintended, frankly, circumstance, and that's something that I think is, I, I, when I suggest curative language, certainly I did not, it was an example, it would have to be vetted, but I, I'm looking more at the issue of, let's say, for instance, separation of powers, and when I look at the separation <coughs> of powers, that generates a lot of discussion within the charter, and that's an overall arching uh, discussion rather than going, and there are things in here that sometimes repeat themselves with regard to when these kind of issues of separation of powers comes up, and, and maybe, maybe this is not the forum to do that, and I, I, I don't want the fact that this, what an example is, it's an example, it's not something, it's not a, a recommendation on my part. If, it's better if council looks, rather than what curative language might be, because frankly, I did not really have an opportunity um, or an, uh, 
in hindsight, to be able to, to do that it would have been better if, if had it been vetted with the city attorney, they had, did not have much time to comment on this, and I don't think council should put much weight in the language. I think it's more important, um, Ms. Schroeder, uh, for the overarching um, uh, discussions about how to resolve some of these issues. And council, I, I just want to say that it's not my recommendations that you take this curative language, because frankly, and Ms. Zellin made that very clear, they really haven't been fully vetted, and that is something that um, is um, something that I really think is, is, is hurting the process just to focus on that. And I Thank you, Mr. Shelby. Yes, it's really important to understand the intent when words are, are being used or a suggestion. Uh, Mr. Carlson and then Mr. Goods. Yeah, um, I, I would just like to, based on what the city attorney said, um, I, I'm not using the language that was proposed by uh, uh, Mr. Shelby. Um, I'm, I'm proposing the language that I, that I put in here, but I will modify my motion to say that, um, that I would like to move that the city attorney look at this language and either edit it or propose an alternative to present back to council. That's the information that I was handed on the sheet of paper yes. that I passed over here to our Yes, yeah, so paper. the modification is to, is to edit it or propose an alternative and present back to council. So heard. I will, I will accept that Sec, uh, as the seconder. I will accept that if you add a date of like really soon. But I think all of, all of these are coming back on a certain date, right? That's an issue because council, it depends on how many you make and what the, what, what the turnaround time is, whether it can be. And Ms. Zellman and I. Do we not set a schedule this. for the first reading? Based. The schedule on the first reading is what is required to work backwards from the date that the supervisor of elections has to get this for its Okay, deadline. why don't we just say, why don't, I'll, just, I'll just say, add it to my motion that, that to be presented at the date that we, that we agree on at the end of the day for first reading. Right, because that's one of our outcomes is to look at next steps and timeline. Yeah. That makes sense. Yes. Uh, Mr. Goods, and then it looks like we want to call for a vote to move this forward. Yes, sir. You know, as I sit here, I guess I still have a police mentality that this back and forth, there's something on the table, you make a decision, we make a decision, we move on it. You know, Mr. Maniscal, who's a good friend of mine, he talks about Ferrari, talks about getting along, but at the end of the day, what this man always hears, and it, it frustrates me to no end, I'm not the city attorney. I have to follow what the city attorney does. But Mr. Maniscal just said, we have our own city attorney, and he tells us, this, this, this. but that's not how it's been operating. That's not how I have seen it operate. I've seen him tell me, and time and time again, he's got on there and say, I, I have to go through legal and go to the city attorney for approval for this, this, and that. I've heard that time and time again. So he does not have the authority to do certain things. He does not as our counsel. And sometimes it frustrates me that sometimes he doesn't speak up about things I think he should speak up about. So that's why I have an issue with this, because it's still, you have one body who's still dictating what goes on versus if there is a dispute, who's going to settle the dispute? That's the issue I have. And I don't understand how this council doesn't see that or doesn't understand it either. This is not for political points or trying to do what's wrong. Do what's right. Don't be a coward. You know what something is wrong. Fix what's wrong. If you've got a problem, there's a problem here. I yield back. Mr. Goods, so the information that was shared by Mr. Carlson, everyone at the dais has a copy of that? Yes. All right. And the clerk. And the clerk. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Schroeder. Miranda. As I stated earlier, you see the problem. The public can hear the problem. It makes no difference who the city attorney is. It makes no difference who the city council attorney is. You're going to have the same problem because that's the way it is. There's eight elected officials. And somewhere along the line, we can't even make vegetable soup <laughs> because the ingredients are there, but we're not boiling it. We're boiling it without water, and therefore you're going to get nothing but slop. We have a personality problem. Like I said it earlier, there's five mayors I work with. They all were different, and they all told you to come in the office anytime you wanted. At least I've been told that. You, know, you just walk in. I don't care what mayor is there. They're going to come out and talk to you and hold whoever's there in the office. That's the way the system works. And it's been working like that for 100 years. 
And all of a sudden, now we want to hire more attorneys, more gamble, more this, more that, more aides, more this, one or the other, and yet I got people who can't even pay the rent. Thank you very much. Thank you. I believe we want to call for a vote. Mr. Carlson, could you restate what it is that your motion is calling for? And we want to see it up on the notes that's been taking, taken over here. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. So I will, I, my motion is to ask the city attorney to uh, come back on the first uh, reading uh, that we will decide at the end of the day with and proposed edits or alternative to the following. Um, the, the following would be to propose a new 6.09 conflict resolution. Should a conflict arise between city council and the mayor or between either party and the city attorney, such conflict should be resolved in a quick, objective, and collegial manner so as to best represent the interests of the residents of Tampa. In the event of a conflict, the two parties, under coordination by the city attorney, will appoint an arbitration panel consisting of three arbitrators who will be jointly selected by the two parties. Either through their attorneys or outside counsel appointed by the city attorney, the two parties will present their case to the arbitration panel. The arbitration panel will give their judgment on the matter and both parties will be bound by their ruling. Thank you. May we call for a vote to take this forward? We need a second. I have a second if I... Uh, yeah, I'm not... All right, so no I'll second. Take it, I'll take see where it goes. Please restate that, I'm sorry. He seconded it. He seconded it, thank you. It carries with a vote of four. Yes. How do you want Maybe to Maybe see the four. Somebody got to call for a roll call vote, I guess. All right. Or you could do a, a, ro you could do a voice vote. Or just do vo a, a voice vote. Either way. Do you want to do a hand vote? I can see by hands, yes. If we have four, yeah. we need to see who votes. Okay. Are we voting now? Yes. And it has to be announced. Okay. She's so it's one to six. Wait a second. No, that's not. Works. Does that work? I don't know. But is that working? You're, you, asked us to, you asked us to raise our hands, right? Yes. Okay. So is it is it six to one? Or Wait. That's it? That's, that's okay. It's dead. Let's move on to the next well, one. No, no, no. Wait a no, second. We vote. Yes, we just did. No, you didn't. It wasn't. All I asked for a show of hands. We had one hand up. Uh, oh, and, whose hand, and whose hand was it? Mr. Carlson. Okay. I didn't hear it. It's dead. Thank you. So as we move forward, again, if you were looking at Article 2, legislative, depending upon the... Can I just make one more comment? This puts our city in grave danger. Um, and it's not a personality conflict. This is a, a conflict where um, uh, there is a separation of powers and we have to follow the charter. And when somebody inside the city is not following the charter, we're responsible for, um, for sticking to it. And we have no ability to fight it. And so I hope that there will be other modifications of the charter, but this puts us in grave danger of, um, of, of putting the taxpayers at risk here. Thank you. Thank you. I'll call on Ms. Hurtak in just a moment. So, Mr. Carlson, you referenced another part of the charter that touches on this. Might there be an opportunity there? Let's just go on. Let's, let's just go on through the list like you suggested in the seat. Yes. Ms. Hurtak, did you have a comment on <coughs> Yes, this I vote? actually wanted to have a separate motion. You want to on the separate same motion. idea. Yes. All because right. I agree it's a secured we have to solve this. But I just want to go back to the example of curative language and take out in a um, court of competent jurisdiction. So my motion is, um, uh, and, and I'm, I'm not quite sure, and, and let me just make the motion and then maybe we can talk it out. So my motion is uh, to add, um, and sure, I'll make it a section 6.09. Um, in the event of a dispute between the mayor and city council, which cannot be reconciled, the city shall utilize independent council. Second. Period. But, yeah, well, that, that's, I guess, my question for my colleagues is if, if our city attorney is saying we can't um, use that, uh, that we shouldn't, that we can't sue, and if they're saying that, you know, arbitrators 
we, we don't have the ability to use arbitrators, but she is saying that we can use outside counsel. I'm just not sure how. It, Mr. Carlson, did you understand that? Because yeah, I did not. The only thing I would add is, please, uh, to add that that would report to the city council attorney. Okay, so independent counsel, that would report Ms. to Schroeder? the city council attorney? Ms. Schroeder. So then I amend that motion to say, in the event of a dispute between the mayor and city council, which cannot be reconciled, the city shall utilize independent counsel that would report to the city council attorney. We have a question by Mr. Shelby. Thank you, Ms. Hertag. May I, this is a f interesting discussion because this charter is an organic document. It's a holistic document. One section relates to the other sections. And for instance, the, uh, the issue with the separation of powers, it comes back to the section 501A. You haven't even gotten to that yet. And uh, that says that the city attorney shall be the final legal representative to the city. To have somebody report back to me does not accomplish anything pursuant to this charter. So, so I'm, I'm concerned about looking at these things piecemeal rather than organically because and maybe it was uh, 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 it was not the best choice to put this in the section where something can go because you're going to find overlaps in sections other where the separation of power just comes up. So the, the, the memo really makes things more complicated, frankly, than it needs to be because I don't want council to be in a position of making motions that are going to require the city attorney to do some work by first reading and have it come back and it, it, won't make, it, won't, it won't make it to the ballot. The issue should be whether it makes it to the ballot by this point in time. But what I'm saying to you now is that, to the maker of the motion, to have somebody report to me does not imbue them with any power because that would be in violation of the charter. And we're not, we're not at that point where we can have this kind of discussion at a, you know, a workshop, in, 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 and it's true, over a long period of time the city Charter Review Commission was able to discuss these things and debate them, but for this, like for instance, this one time, this one little subject, um, I think the chairman is, is right in terms of um, what effect this is going to have, what is ultimately going to be accomplished by the end of the day. Before I call on Mr. Goodies, Ms. Hertek, that was directed at you. Did you have any comment to modify? Sure. Um, I'll just take out that report to the city council attorney and just say, shall utilize independent council to resolve the dispute. Second. Second, may we have a vote on that as the other motion on the floor with a second. Question. I'm sorry, Mr. Goodies, I did say we'd call on you. I, I think you still run into an issue with the, with the section five. I think still after the independent council has made a written decision, it will go back to the city attorney for, for the, the, the ruling because it, 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 it's, at the end of the day, 509 says it's the ultimate decision so I think once the decision is made, you're going to put that in for 609. I think it has to come back to the city attorney that the decision was made. That's just my rationale because I think you're you're bumping in to a situation because five says the city attorney make the ultimate decision. So my thing, she's going to make the ultimate decision, and you're saying we're going to have an independent counsel for the dispute. It should go back to the city attorney so the decision can be be uh, be uh, be forthright and put out. So my, it's my opinion. I, I think we should just vote up or down on this. We've, I've got a lot of suggestions for Section 5, and yes, other sir. people can weigh in on that too. And so All right. And again, because it's organic, if something needs to change, this is not final language at this moment. We're simply trying to get something on the table that has as much of your input and much of your thoughts as possible. We can still go back. We can circle back and modify. There's not a, there's not a final uh, decision today. So. With the motion as was made by Ms. Hertak, and she amended it by taking out a court of competent jurisdiction. <laughs> could we have a vote? Four will carry it. If you could raise your hands, we'll call on you that you will carry that forward. We have three Mr. Carlson, Ms. Hertak, and uh, Mr. Goods. That does not carry. So let's move forward. We're at Article 2 legislative and we have section 201 city council 202 qualifications 203 organizations 204 is staff 
205 exercise, 206 ordinances and resolutions, so on. There's many. Who would like to comment on anything in section two? Please raise your hand if that's one of your areas. I saw Mr. Carlson's hand. Yes. Would you please call out the section? Yes, um, section 2.0. One for you, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> there should be one for everybody. I don't know if there's one for the facilitator. If we have one at the end, we'll give it. Um, <clears throat> Would you again I put this, state this section? I put this down as section 2.04B1. Um, <clears throat> so toward the end, what I want to do, <clears throat> excuse me, is, um, is, is further in, in defining the role of the city council attorney. Again, we're going to get a 5.0. Uh, in a minute, but just add that the we need to explicitly add that the city city council attorney has the right to hire legal staff or outside counsel as approved by city council. And yes, this means not going through the city attorney because we need objectivity. What's the per the, the problem is that the city <clears throat> the city attorney cannot be an employment law attorney, a litigator, uh, uh, a charter attorney, an ethics attorney. He can't know everything, although he knows almost everything. We need to be able to hire specialists to answer questions when we need them, and especially when we get opinions from a city attorney that we don't agree with. And so we can modify section five in a minute, but the city council attorney needs the ability to hire outside uh, either legal staff or outside counsel. So I would move that we, um, again, ask the, uh, the it, it's not gonna be the city attorney, the city attorney is gonna hire an outside attorney that we'll pick, but that the city attorney through their attorney, their outside attorneys would review this and um, and and propose um, uh, an ordinance to be presented at the at the uh, first hearing date that we will decide at the end of the day. Ms. Hertag, I just had a question of where you want to put this, like after in section one, after B one, at the end. As um, because that says, and providing independent advisory opinions as requested by the city council. Um, so are you proposing to add this as number three under B? It's been so long since I did this, I forgot. It, it, let's just say that I want to add this into section 2.04 and then the, that we can sort it out. Okay, yeah, I, I think it, it fits under. For the city attorney, it's, yes. it's in regard to the city, mm -hmm. yeah, city so council attorney. Oh, city council attorney. Yes. Okay. Um, and yes, it would be adding a number three. Or adding it. So it would be section section two point oh four three, and defining the role of the, of the city council attorney to add the language that that the city council attorney can quote hire legal staff or outside counsel as approved by city council. So B three <laughs> is what you're adding. Yes. Okay. I'm. I'll second that. Yes. Mr. Vieira, did I see your hand earlier? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, and, and this is a very apparently narrowly tailored proposal. Um, my, uh, my concerns with it is, number one, um, with, with the outside counsel, in other words, and maybe there's a question for legal, is there something that precludes, or, or, or Mr. Shelby, is there something that precludes Mr. Shelby um, from potentially retaining outside counsel already that would necessitate a charter amendment, number one. Number two, the, the potentially overly expansive inclusion of quote unquote legal staff, which could be so vague. I'm, I'm personally of the opinion, call me naive, I don't think Mr. Shelby, and again, we're, we're looking at the future city council attorneys, so not just this one, but I don't think there's presently a need for legal staff. I haven't heard that from Mr. Shelby. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, he can correct that record if, if that is so. Um, so, so again, my, my issue with this is why go through the charter with this if it's not precluded already, um, and maybe the expansive nature of the legal staff. That's the one that bothers me uh, the most, but just questions I pose. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Miranda had a Thank hand. You. And I'm not opposed to making some changes, but the more changes we make, the more conversation we're going to have on the changes, us and future council members. I don't know if the legal department now upstairs have legal aids that does the research. I guess that's what this is addressing. I'm not sure. But I would say if they do, is very limited. I, can I ask that question of the city attorney? May I you ask really that know. question? May I? Yes. City attorney, can you answer that? I don't really know. I apologize. 
Can you repeat the I'm question? sorry, I, I'm, I made a statement without knowing the answer, uh, which is uh, perfectly legal with me, that way I'm not biased. <coughs> when you do your, you have a case come before you, do you have aides that do your legal research or do you, the attorneys that work for you do it themselves? I would say most of the attorneys in our office do our own research. We have a few paralegals on staff, um, but I can tell you from my personal perspective, and I think most of the attorneys in my office are that way, even if we have a law clerk or, or a paralegal do preliminary research for us, we always follow up with our own. Because uh, it's our I, name I'm, that goes I can't on the vote for this. pleading. Just gonna, we're going to create another legal firm, and we're going to have two firms and two different opinions. We have to come to some common sense grounds where we can live together. That's the problem we got in the world. That's the problem we got in Washington, and I don't want that problem in Tampa. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Goods. Mr. Vieira brought Mr. Shelby into this by utilizing his names. I like this Mr. Shelby because he think he needs staff or he needs a uh, paralegal or, you know, we've got to the thing of uh, 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 an attorney when he may be out. So I like this Mr. Shelby. Mr. Shelby asking for an opinion on your part. The, um, to have an outside counsel still comes back to the issue of separation of powers and the role of the city well, attorney. I, I just, Shelby, I asked you, oh, do in terms of, in terms you, of staff? Do you need staff? Do you need any? That's what we're asking. But if you do, you don't have to put that in the budget and the charter necessarily. Uh, that, that, that wasn't my question. Mr. Vera asked a certain thing. So I just I'm, need you to tell me, do you need help? You don't? Do you, make, do you think this is valid? That's all I'm asking. Well, in the 18 years that I've been doing this job, I've not had that uh, that that help, and I've I mean certainly this council is um, uh, different in a lot of respects, um, and if I do have any concerns, I do have the opportunity to uh, to to be able to uh, uh, address them. I don't know whether it's relevant with the time be constraints being what this is, whether this is necessary to be in the charter. That's my position. Uh, you're, asking me, you're asking me a staffing question right now, and, 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 and that's outside the scope of this charter. Do, you're saying, okay, so you're saying now, do I need to have uh, the opportunity to hire legal help if, if I need it? If, there you go, Mr. If you, as of right now, the answer is no. As of right now. Mr. Maniscalco. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shelby, for answering that. But my question is, uh, why do we have to put this on the charter? Don't we have money within our city council budget? Should we need to hire a legislative aid or, or a legal aid or whatever if that arises? You said at this point, no, but the money is there uh, to expand, uh, you know, in, in your department, in your capacity, correct? Well, the answer is, if it's additional staff, that's, that at the end of section 2.04, it brings it up how you can be able to do that. Um, I was thinking if I, I was and I, I really don't want to discuss this publicly, but I was thinking of having conversations with the city attorney with regard to, you know, um, 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 uh, the use of a paralegal if I should need one, but I haven't discussed that with her personally or publicly. Um, I didn't um, anticipate that. So the answer, the answer to your question is yes. If it's a budgetary issue, um, it can be put into the budget. You can add. You, you can okay, add that and we just need no fewer than five members of the city council, correct? All right. So there majority. Is. Thank you, sir. There was a hand with Ms. Hertak before Mr. Carlson. Yes. Um, never mind. Mr. Carlson. Please. If the, if the city council attorney wanted to hire outside counsel or hire his own staff, um, in your opinion, is that allowed by the charter as it stands now? The charter says that you can hire other staff in order to support your legislative functions. And so it's your, it's your opinion that he can hire outside counsel. If he wants to hire uh, a law firm that reports to him and not to your department, he can do that. Well, if you're asking the question about the power of that outside opinion, which I think was what Marty was getting to earlier, the charter still says that the city attorney is the final legal opinion of the city as a whole. 
So if, for example, Mr. Shelby wanted to hire outside counsel to help him with an issue that he wasn't comfortable opining on, he could, but it would still ultimately be up to our office to determine whether that was the position of the city of Tampa. But if we, if we put in the budget following charter, we put in the budget to hire him staff or hire him outside counsel, you're not going to object? I believe it's already in the charter. The charter right. says you can you're, hire additional staff can, with five votes in order to assist you in your legislative functions. Yeah, as far as I remember, and I'll have to go back and look at it, but I think at least one of your predecessors said, no, they have to be hired by the city attorney and then they can work with the city council attorney. But the reason to put this in there is so that no city attorney can interpret the charter. Following that narrow line that says that, 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 that the city attorney is the last word, the former city attorneys have used that to justify how um, we cannot hire staff for the city council attorney. And I want to make sure you just said on the record that that's not true. I'm saying I it depends if, if, if the purpose of getting the outside counsel is to arrive at a final decision of the city, then no, because ultimately that's our office. If the purpose of getting outside counsel is just to get another objective opinion, which can then be reviewed by the city attorney's office, I have no objection to that, and there's no reason I should. But like on the on the situation years ago around the CRB, when the former mayor said, um, "I only I alone have the right to set up the CRB," and city council said no, uh, former city attorney, one of your predecessors, hired an outside attorney who's very well respected, but came back with an opinion that supported what that mayor said. Um, the city council members I knew objected to that, didn't agree with it. Uh, if that happened now, then then we could hire an outside counsel that would also give give city council an independent review, just like the mayor is able to go through the city attorney's office to get an outside review, correct? If you're talking about the Gwen Young opinion, the, which I have a copy of, I don't want to go if into you specifics, want to review it, that wasn't about the creation. I mean, it was it arose during the discussion about the creation of the CRB, but ultimately, she was opining on whether there was a conflict between the council and the mayor and what the role of the city attorney was. And I agree with her opinion, and I'm happy to share it with all of you. Um, as I case, said, at the end of the day, whether the outside council is hired by my office or by Marty, or if you want to have one of your attorneys write an opinion, ultimately I still have to review it, consider it, and determine what is the final opinion of the city of Tampa. But another example um, uh, that the former city attorney said that only the city attorney has the right to sign contracts for settlements and um, and uh, and pay those. And so, um, if if we disagree with that, and city attorney hires an outside counsel, former Bart president, to opine on that, and is Marty allowed to hire a former? Uh, bar president to opine on it also and then we can get both former bar presidents to stand up and say what their opinions are and if they disagree sure the city attorney's opinion is the final opinion uh, but but we will then have you know equally prestigious person who who may disagree with the person the city attorney brings forth but you're saying it's a, it's okay by the charter now that the city council attorney could hire that person the, the city council can hire additional staff to assist it in its legislative functions with five votes and if that staff is used to hire an outside counsel to provide an opinion, there's nothing in the charter that would prevent that. But again, at the end of the day, it, it's ultimately my determination whether that is the final legal opinion of the city of Tampa. So to my colleagues, we have this city attorney on the record, and we know that she's different, so we're not criticizing her for past mistakes of city attorneys. But um, uh, we... Um, we have her on the record as saying we can do this. However, we, it, I've, if I remember correctly, I've heard other city attorneys uh, opine differently. And so I would recommend that we pass this because it's, it's better to have it clear in the charter rather than have any ambiguity that could be disputed by some future city attorney. Thank Mr. Carlson, if I may paraphrase, what I heard based on this discussion just so that there's clarity is words make a difference, meaning because somebody inhabits a particular office, that person may change. You want it stated such that no matter who is serving in that position, that the opinion is clear of what the city council attorney Yeah, what, what's may happened do. is that, and, and we'll probably go through this on every one of these, what's happened is that everything, I, my style is to try to discuss in, in private and have private conversations with everybody and then 
I'm told, no, 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 we can't do that. Charter prevents it, charter prevents it. And then if we try to bring it up publicly because we got told no, then a, a city attorney will jump before us and say, you're trying to usurp the strong mayor form of government. I'll say it says right here in the charter, here's what it says, and they'll disagree with us. And, and so uh, what I wanna make sure of is that we, is that city council has an objective opinions and objective advice. This is really important because the only person who reports to us besides our aides is the city council attorney. If that person is not able to get objective advice then, um, uh, and for us, then, then we rely on the city attorney's office, which in the past I think has not always represented city council, which by the way, the charter clearly says that the city attorney does represent city council, not only collectively, but individually. And so we need to, um, we need to stop saying that it doesn't. All right, thank you. I, I, I would suggest we just call this for a vote and just keep moving. Yes. Do we have a motion of exactly how you want that to be? I, I would I make I would like to move that um, that that we um, ask the city city attorney's outside attorney to come back on the date that we will agree on as to the first reading with a new um, an edited version of the following a new section two point oh four B three um, quote hire legal staff or outside counsel as approved as approved by city council. And again, this is defining the role of a city council attorney. Yes, sir. Second. I, I just want to say. Uh, Ms. Hertek raised her hand. Bill second. Bill second. May we have a vote? Are we second. voting? Yeah. 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 Favor, we'll vote. Yeah. In order to pass, we need four. We have three. Oh. We have uh, Mr. Carlson, Ms. Hertek, and I'm sorry, say, do it again. I saw a third hand. Mr. Goose. Mr. Goods, thank you. It did not. It did not pass. Just remember to my colleagues, the public is going to reelect you, not the mayor. Just the public wants us colleagues. to provide oversight, and if this mayor does not want to provide transparency and accountability, um, one way or another, we're going to get it for the public. We're not going to allow this administration to continue to run over city council and to set up city council to get sued and uh, thrown out of office. Thank. You. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Miranda had his Thank hand, and then Mr. Vieira. Right. Let me say that's what elections are for, to someone to get elected, whether there's anyone on the board or not, and, and that's, that's the only way of doing it. However, that being said, it's, uh, it's really sad when you have to bring up an election during a budget hearing, or not a budget hearing, but a review of the charter, and uh, there, there's nothing to fear in an election. You see, someone wins and nobody loses. Somebody just doesn't get enough votes. And that's how you have to look at things at life. When I sit here and listen to this, I, it's a $1.9 billion company, and yet, as much money as it sounds, those budgets are very tight. Out of all the Avalor money we collect, all of it, doesn't pay for the police and fire. In fact, it's about $26 million short. So when I look at these things, it, it's imperative that we understand that the public's money should be spent wisely. I have heard no evidence from the city council attorney. He said no when he was asked if he needed any more help. We have to have continuity and you have to believe in each other and you have to trust each other before you take a step forward. If you don't, you're going to fail. And there's where we're at, in my opinion. Yes, sir. Mr. Vieira, you also had a hand? Yes, ma'am, please. Thank you. Uh, and thank then you we'll very move much. forward. And, and I want to just re respectfully caution all city council members about the, uh, uh, how should I put it, straw man of, of, of straw woman, whatever you want to call it, of the mayor. There are certain things I've agreed with the mayor on. There are certain things I've disagreed with the mayor on. I remember on the issue of the, um, uh, the so-called crime-free housing program uh, was requested to uh, uh, support that. I said, no, I do not support that. I'm going to come out very strongly against it, just the way that it is. There are certain things that I agree. There are certain things I disagree. When it comes to our charter amendments, there is one that I have committed to vote for where I disagree with the executive on. My votes have to do with, and, and I'm only speaking on behalf of myself, my votes have to do with what I think about the process, what I think about each individual issue that comes up has nothing to do with my relationship with the mayor, with, 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 with anyone else, just my opinion. I, I, I firmly respect the hard work, the, the, the analytical, the, the, the analysis, et cetera, that Councilman Carlson has put into all these. I really, really do, which is why they each deserve 
um, scrutiny and rationale as to how you're going to vote in each. Because I, I respect that 110 percent. But again, as for me and my house, that's the rationale I use for each vote. It has absolutely nothing to do with anybody else uh, as, as in the past, et cetera. It's just my opinion. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So let's decide. We have 204 that's been dealt with. What else in section two would someone like to bring up for discussion? And just call out the section, please, if so. All the way up to 214. Mr. Carlson. No, nope, never mind. So do we move to section three? We can circle back as needed, but do we move up to section three, city clerk, anything there? Section four, article four, executive. We've got 401 and two. One is mayor, two is absence and succession. Please identify yourself if you would like to comment on section four. Ms. Hartak. Um, yes, uh, uh, separation of powers in 4.0.1 to discuss the difference. Um, Section 1, 4.01, mm -hmm. 1, that reads the administration and enforcement of all laws. Is that the line you're referring to? Uh, yes. Um, and to add. I guess to number 12, um, uh, as number 12, rather, um, an executive order in conflict with law or ordinance shall be void. <coughs> I'm going to agree with. Let's give that a moment for the note taker and get that up here. Could you say that again? And she'll take An notes. executive order in conflict with law or ordinance should be void, shall be void. This was also the example of curative language that Mr. Shelby gave yes. in his document. Got it, got it. Discussion on this, please. Something that you want to modify? Question. Yes, Mr. Citro. Uh, are you referring to all city laws? Or are you talking yes. to state laws also? Um, city laws uh, in conflict with law or ordinance. With, with city laws, with, with our charter and our ordinances and our laws. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't understand exactly the, the, the preference of it. Tell me again what that is. Can, did you get the understanding of what it means? Are you asking the one yeah, that needs to understand it? I'm sorry. That's sure. fine that you raise it. You're raising it to someone to please explain that further to you. Yes, yes sir. Okay. If, if I can. Mr. Shelby, yes. This goes back to, to separation of powers, and this goes back to the, the issue of the, um, the ability to home rule authority of the city council. And I, this is a much bigger discussion, frankly. But one of the issues that came up and it was raised is does the an executive order preempt, preempt the city council from subject matter to be able to have an ordinance that would be reflective of the public policy that was in the form of law. And that, that actually, this goes back to the 2015 CRB. And what happened was that um, the city council was contemplating doing an ordinance. The mayor executed an executive order. 
and the mayor was quoted in the newspaper saying that city council no longer had jurisdiction, words to that effect, because it could not have an ordinance because there was the executive order and it, it was not subject to um, city council getting involved in that. Um, that was the basis of that. So the question is, what is the role under home rule of city council that goes back to the separation of powers issue? And the question is, whether or not the, that, that the executive order has the same weight as law, because one is legislative and one is executive. And that was the, the, the subject of a lot of discussions that this council, this particular council, has had about the authority. And that was raised, I guess, by Councilman Carlson um, most recently with the, the, the naming authority. Um, it's, it's the kind of question that it's an overarching question, and if it's a form of government, certainly with a strong mayor form of government, that it's a public policy question, whether or not the council wants to give greater weight to law to be able to override perhaps an executive order, and that's what goes back to what Mr. Miranda said. The mayor's remedy to that is a vote of five. Uh, excuse me, there is, is the, the council's remedy to a, a mayoral veto is a, a vote of five, whereas if council doesn't even have the authority to have an ordinance, then that doesn't even apply. Thank you. Mr. Miranda, yeah, did that you answer much. your question? Yep. Let me just respond to it so I can get it fixed. Yes. Seven years ago, some mayor, I guess it was a previous mayor, made a statement to the newspaper. Whether it's correct or not correct, I don't know. I didn't make the statement. The city attorney at that point is the one that says who's right and who's wrong. Did it ever get to the city attorney? I don't know. I don't know. I don't recall that debate. Uh, I know there was at the beginning of uh, the formation, there was some conversation as to who was going to appoint the, the board and how many individuals were going to be on the board. And, and we settled something on some formula where it was, at the end, very equitable. And everybody agreed to it. And that's how the board was formed. That doesn't mean in the beginning there was not a toggle between difference of balances, and that's what that, that court law does, that lady holding the two sides. Who is right and who is wrong doesn't matter. It's the results that really matter. So are we looking at it for substance, or are we looking at it for whatever reason? If that mayor made that, so he made some news. Whether it was good or not, you got to ask him. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Goods? I, I'm confused. I don't see how an executive order would override an ordinance or yeah. law when the book clearly states in the charter that city council sets legislation for this city uh, and uh, the, it's the, it's the job of the mayor is to carry out the orders of city council for executive, for, for a legislative, legislative body. Uh, so I don't know how an executive order uh, would, 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 would overturn uh, an ordinance or law that this council puts in. I do see the part of putting the language in so it's clear that an executive order cannot be in conflict with an ordinance or legislative law by this council. So I, I could support that today because that would be right. An executive order cannot be in conflict with an ordinance of this council per what the charter already says that we set the tone and the rules for law. So clarifying exactly what the curative language had offered that in conflict seems to be the critical phrase in that piece. Yeah. Mr. Carlson. Yeah, two quick examples. Um, the example of the CRB, the whole problem with the CRB is that folks that are in the room and others that aren't tried to create the CRB in a certain way back in 2015 and the last mayor disagreed. So he passed an executive order. And then those of you who are on council know, city council then there's this whole fight where the city attorney got involved, hired outside council, city, city council passed an ordinance anyway and there was kind of a compromise of having both of those, but that was never tested as to which one would stand. And then when we redid the CRB with the picture that um, Mr. Bennett showed, um, supposedly the old or executive order was superseded. Uh, that was part of the deal. And then the new executive order was there. Um, but let's say the, the naming process, the naming of buildings, I'm just using this as a simple example because it doesn't bring in a lot of other issues, but it, as a very simple thing, that was the new process was put in place by executive order. And there are whereas clauses in there that say that only the mayor has the right to uh, name buildings. 
and the legal department agrees with that. So if we pass an ordinance that says we're gonna name something, or if we pass an ordinance that says only city council has the right to name buildings, um, then we're gonna have a legal test. That's why I thought we needed a, a conflict resolution clause because if the city attorney disagrees and, and says that the, that the mayor's executive order supersedes the city council's ordinance, then we have a conflict because we have a legal opinion that doesn't agree with what we, the way we read the charter. So anything that we can do to clarify this, I would be in favor of, and if there's not a second, I'll second. Thank you. No, noticing the time, do we have enough information to have a motion on this and have a vote? Do we have enough information? I, I think it's clear, the charter says that no order will be in conflict, no executive order will be in conflict with a, 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 the legislative body. So this legislative body put in the ordinance, it's the mayor's job to carry out that legislative duty. So that's, that's pretty clear with this covered language and they give order in conflict with the law or ordinance shall be void. So you're ready to make a motion? Make a motion. Yes, sir. Second. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Okay. May we have a vote? Well, he wants to speak on it. No, no. no. We haven't yeah. said anything. So. I mean, if we may, 20 seconds each. Yes, you may. Thank you very much. So I was here in 2015 when that issue came up regarding the creation of the CRB. Um, from my understanding, the opinion from the city attorney at the time was incorrect and the executive order thing uh, I disagree with. Uh, I think ordinance shows existing ordinance. And I, and I asked this question, I think, uh, of the city council attorney seven years ago, that city council had the authority to do that. It's clear in the charter. It's clear from, I'm not going to cite the ordinance, but the information is there. Um, that didn't go to a further discussion because a settlement was reached with that mayor. How do I know that? Because I tried to, to work it out with him and, and we ended up uh, moving forward without escalating it to a, a bigger issue. However, it's already existing in the charter. It's somebody decided to interpret it their way. Uh, I can read. I, have, I even have an English degree on my, uh, on my wall in my office that, that uh, shows it. Uh, I am... <laughs> Whatever, but uh, you know, I, I have interpreted it correctly back then. It's clear. It's someone gave a different opinion in 2015 that I still disagree with, but I don't see the necessity in having to change that. I mean, myself, I'm not an attorney. An attorney, anybody else could clearly interpret it if they read that we have the authority under ordinance, which is the existing law, that we can create these boards and whatnot. So in that case, um, we, just, we disagree, but it's already clearly stated in the charter. So there's no need, as you're stating, to have this exactly. modification. Yes. Uh, Mr. Uh, Vieira, yeah, did you also have a 20 uh, second comment? 20 seconds, yes ma'am, thank you very much. Yeah, and, and again, it, it appears to already, it, it's, it's almost like a restatement of fact or a restatement of already something that exists within the charter and our present law, therefore it makes it um, unnecessary. It's not a hurt, I, I don't think there's any um, adverse consequences of it, I, I just, I, I haven't seen the case presented on why a restatement of, of present charter language in effect should be incorporated. That's my question, and that's it. Thank you, ma'am. Would you please read what the current language is? Can you locate that? Can somebody locate that? I don't have Can I make a statement on that, ma'am? One, one second. Does anybody have that, that current language that you said is already in there? Well, in, in other words, <laughs> may I? Yes. May I? In other words, it's my understanding that it already an executive order does not override an ordinance. That's always been my understanding. In other words, is there, in other words, my, my question, if I may, is why is this necessary? Um, something that is a restatement already of our, of our reality. That's the question that I'm posing. I'm posing yes. that as a question to folks for purposes of my vote. Yes, I, he I hear your question, uh, I, Mr. Goods. Yeah, I don't know what time frame we're in, but I really don't. Yeah, it's been stated, but Mr. Manuskalwa said there was an issue. You might have worked it out, but it, it wasn't clear to others who may have the great English uh, uh, degree that you have to understand. And for Mr. Vieira to say, I mean, it's yeah, it's here. I can read it all day long, but obviously there's been conflict. So how do you resolve conflict? You make sure that people can see where it needs to be so they'll never have this issue again. So if it's in Section 401 that an executive order in conflict with law ordinance shall be voided, I don't see the big issue of putting that in number in four, number 4.01 as number 12. It, it states that again in the charter again, but I think it needs to be there so there's no misinterpretation of, of that rule. So I don't understand how we 
I, I just don't understand today what we're doing here. I, I just don't. Uh, and, and to me, it, I don't want to say the word political, but some of this stuff is common sense to me, especially 401. Yes, it's down further in the charter, but I think it needs to be in the mayor's section that an executive order in conflict with a law ordinance should be void. So, Mr. Mr. Goods, if I might paraphrase, you're saying if there's a potential for misunderstanding, why do we not go ahead and suggest that this be added? Correct. All right. So we had a motion on the table, and it was seconded. Do you want to vote on this that we? <laughs> the, um, it, a, a prior city attorney, just like the Mr. example. Mr. Carlson, yes. Ju just like the example that Mr. Mas uh, Chair, uh, Council Member Mascalco gave. There are many interpretations by the city attorney that haven't been correct. And so we need, even if it's redundant, we need to clarify it so that future city attorneys know clearly what the charter says. We had a city attorney come to us when we started talking about the CRB a couple years ago and said, um, city council cannot delegate a subpoena power because city council doesn't have subpoena power. I will read section, it's short, section, 2.14 investigations in the exercise of its legislative powers this council or any special committee thereof shall have the power to conduct such investigations and hold such hearings as the council shall deem necessary expedient and proper and shall have the power to compel the attendance of witnesses and production of evidence by the issuance of all forms of subpoena and shall have the power to punish for blah 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 it, and and so the point is that we get these. Uh, we get these opinions. Can I ask City Attorney a simple question? Um, and I don't want to go back and opine on all these. All these past. It, it's a separate discussion about the former uh, inaccurate um, interpretations. But I just want to ask your interpretation. Does the Charter now say that an ordinance supersedes an executive order? So before we get to that, I want to correct the record because you and others keep saying it. Our office did not advise this council that it could not delegate its subpoena power. It said that in order to delegate its subpoena power, this council would have to amend the charter to so state that. So I just it says be right clear. here. It says right here, or any it, the council or any special committee thereof shall have the power. It does. We don't need to change the charter. There it was says a, it right there. there were, you That's do, why I don't want to go into you, this you issue. Ignore but. that advice at your own risk. It was based on case law, is my understanding, and I'm not the expert on this, but it was based on case law. The court is always going to look to a subpoena to determine whether the party issuing it had the power to do so. So the advice was that if you want to delegate subpoena power to a board, you need to amend the charter to say that the city council may delegate its power to that board Which is why, uh, you know, board. I have to hire my own attorneys because the city council attorney cannot hire attorneys, but I have to hire my own attorneys and they give me an opposite opinion. So for, let, we could talk about that issue okay. forever. Well, I just can want you to just, be clear that, that the city attorney didn't say and I disagree you with can't that too. delegate your power. I disagree they with said that too. you have to amend the charter to so state I, that you're going to delegate I, I disagree with that recollection. But anyway, the, can you just answer simply, in your opinion, you're a new city attorney, in your opinion, does an ordinance as the charter is written now, does an ordinance supersede an executive order? It's not a question of superseding. The, the, the example that you keep describing back in 2015, the issue wasn't whether executive order trumps ordinance. The issue was whether the city council had the authority to adopt an ordinance that governed practices of a police department that only the mayor had the authority to manage. That was the issue. So it really wasn't a question of executive order versus ordinance. The mayor, I believe, tried to codify his position in an executive order. But again, I don't, but, I don't want to argue the past. That's all been fixed. But does, if it, it, again, setting aside specific cases, if, if an executive order and an ordinance are in conflict, does the, as the charter is written now, does an ordinance supersede an executive order? It would, I would, I'd have to look at the ordinance itself because I think the bottom line is the mayor can't, a, a, a mayor's executive order will be void if it isn't consistent with law. I mean, it's kind of redundant. I think this was what Councilman Vieira was trying to say. We don't need to amend the charter to say that you can't do something against the law. We already know we can't do something against the law. And if, it, if we get a new if interpretation of charter, is it against the law? 
I get, pardon? If we get, if an executive order was done based on an opinion of a city attorney and, and a new city attorney or an outside attorney shows that it's a wrong interpretation of the charter, then isn't it then against the law and it would be void? The executive order would be void or, or, and or city council can just pass an ordinance to supersede it. I'm not, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just not sure I'm following you. There are past opinions uh, where prior city attorneys said that uh, the, the mayor had certain rights and if, a, if you have a different opinion or if an outside council comes in and has a different opinion, then does that mean that all of those uh, uh, executive orders based on the former opinion are now no, void? I don't, I can't, I can't answer a hypothetical like that. Each would have to be looked at on a case by case basis. But if, 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 if again, if, if an ordinance and, a, and an executive order are in conflict and it doesn't affect any other part of the charter, but if they're in conflict, which one is, which one supersedes the other? Again, you'd have to look at the facts of that particular case. What was the subject matter of the ordinance? What was the subject matter of the executive order? Did council have the authority to adopt the ordinance? Did or is it governed by something that the mayor has control over? And that's why, you know, again, going back to the CRB, that was the argument that the mayor, only the mayor had the authority to manage the affairs of the police department, so only he could do it by executive, you know, create the CRB by executive order. But again, it, it was very fact specific, and I'm probably, you know, talking about it at a 30,000 foot level, and I think there was more to it than that, but. It's going to depend on the facts. But I think the point being, any executive order that's inconsistent with the law is void. You don't, again, you don't need to say the obvious. And the law, you mean an ordinance. So an ordinance, an ordinance passed by city council, it becomes law, is law, and, and, a, and an executive order in conflict with an ordinance is void. That's I, what you just said. I don't want to say that globally because I saw what happened in the past. And again, the point there was that the subject matter of the ordinance was something that was reserved to the mayor. <coughs> thank you, Ms. Elman. Ms. Uh, thank you. So our time is getting close here. We're sort of past the 12 noon that we expected, but nevertheless, this needs to be put to rest if we might do so. Do I have permission to go forward for a few minutes? Mr. Chairman? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, Mr. Goods, and then it looks like we need to make a, a decision on this. Yes, sir. I still got a motion I made. I think that needs to be put in section uh, 401 is number 12. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yeah, I think I, I, I stand by what I, what I the, the, the corrective language. I think it's an order in conflict with law or ordinance shall be void uh, for section 401 and make it number 12. Do we have a second on that? Second. Let's have a vote that you want to adopt this as it is. We've got three, Mr. Carlson, Ms. Hertek, uh, Mr. Goods, it does not uh, carry at this point. I don't think anything's gonna pass today, to be honest with you. Let's look at the, the, the time. Uh, uh, hold on one second, Mr. Miranda. So let's look at the time. Let's assume that we're going to actually leave here at about 12.15. And so that that would give us until 1.15. Is that a reasonable time frame? 60 minutes for lunch? 1.15, everyone. Is that okay? Let's do 115. Is that good? Thank you. 115 is fine. We are adjourned. Thank you.